Good evening, I'm Carolyn Rye, Chair of the School Board of the City of Virginia Beach, and I hereby call this meeting to order at 6 o'clock p.m. on this 25th day of October 2022. We welcome all those present with us in person this evening, and uh, as always, members of the public are able to observe this meeting through live streaming at vbschools.com, broadcast on VBTV Channel 47 and on Zoom. Madam Clerk, will you please announce those school board members in attendance? Thank you, Madam Chair. Present in the school board chamber, we have Chairwoman Rye, Vice Chair Melnick, Ms. Anderson, Ms. Felton, Ms. Franklin, Ms. Holtz, Ms. Hughes, Ms. Manning, Ms. Owens, Ms. Weems. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, would, would all those present please join me in a moment of silence. And please stand as you are able for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, this evening, the school board has the pleasure of recognizing division students, teams, and staff who have been awarded or recognized during state, multi-state, or national competitions or events. And so tonight, I turn it first over to Mrs. Holtz. This evening, the school board has the pleasure of recognizing division students, teams, and staff who have been awarded or recognized during state, multi-state, or national competition or events. Ocean Lakes High School, student Dylan Mosh, perfect score on ACT. Our first our first honoree this evening is an Ocean Lake School sophomore who has been recognized for receiving a perfect score on the ACT. Please welcome Dylan Mock. Uh, Dylan is an ex exceptional student, both inside and outside of the classroom. Obtaining a perfect score on the ACT is no easy feat, especially as a 10th grader student. Less than half of 1% of test takers earn a perfect score on the ACT. Dylan also won first place at the Tidewater Science and Engineering Fair in Medicine and the Health Sciences category. He serves as treasurer of the Ocean Lakes National Latin Honor Society. He's quite the musician, recently auditioning and making it into the Senior Regional Symphony Orchestra as first violin. Dylan's brother, Alan, also received a perfect score on the ACT in September 2019. He's now a sophomore at Brown University. We commend Dylan on this accomplishment. We are proud of you. Yes. All right, I'm especially excited to announce our next honoree because she was um, she taught two of my kids over at Bayside and she was awesome then and evidently she is still super awesome. So our next honoree this evening is a Bayside High School gifted resource teacher who was recognized by the Virginia Association of the Gifted. Please welcome Mrs. Meg Manugo. Mrs. Manugo was named an Outstanding Teacher of the Gifted. 
Winners for this award exhibit outstanding qualities related to gifted education in the areas of teaching, curriculum development, and adaptation. She has taught in VBCPS for 22 years, and 21 of those have been working with gifted students. Mrs. Manugo's principal wrote, I have seen Mrs. Manugo develop a culture of excellence for our gifted students built upon a passion for meeting student needs, a commitment to coaching our teachers, and establishing rapport with all stakeholders in the gifted community. Mrs. Manugo utilizes a combination of content knowledge and gifted objectives to develop lessons with teachers that challenge both of her learner groups, students and teachers. Mrs. Manugo was selected as one of the two 2022 Virginia Beach City Public Schools Outstanding Teachers of the Gifted in the Spring and later received the award for the Virginia Association of the Gifted for Region 2. Congratulations, Meg. Our next honoree this evening is Office of Gifted Programs Coordinator, who is also recognized by the Virginia Association for the Gifted. Please welcome Dr. Dorn Suelo. Welcome, Ms. McCory. The Virginia Association for the Gifted presents the annual Leader of the Year Award to an individual whose exemplary leadership and outstanding contribution to gifted education has affected Virginia's children, teachers, schools, program <coughs> services, and or policies. Dr. McCory coordinates programs and services that focus on underrepresented populations, leverage innovative technology, and provide extensive professional learning opportunities. In her 22 years as an educator, Dr. McCory has worked as a coordinator, gifted specialist, gifted resource teacher, and gifted teacher in Virginia. In 2020, Dr. Dorn was awarded the NAGC Coordinator of the Year, and in 2006, she was selected as a Fraser Scholar for the National Association for Gifted Children. Dr. McCory serves as an officer in several organizations, including the Virginia Association for the Gifted, the Virginia Advisory Committee for the Education of the Gifted, and the George Mason University Project E-Ignite Board. Congratulations, Dr. McCory, for being Virginia Gifted Leader of the Year. We are very proud of you. And we have one more, a fourth presenta recognition presentation this evening. We'd like to welcome Ms. Vivian McMahon, Vice President of Community Impact for the United Way of Hampton Roads. Welcome, Ms. McMahon. Oh, I'm, I have one more <laughs> line here. Uh, Ms. McMahon will be making a presentation to VBCPS this evening, accepting this re resignation. Accepting this recognition will be Mr. John Sutton and Ms. Sharon Shoebridge, the division's United Way campaign coordinators. Great. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. And thank you for having us here today from United Way. As she, as she said, I am Vivian McMahon, new to the community and proud Virginia Beach resident. So happy to be here. Uh, with you all this evening. But even though I am new to the organization and the community, I have been so impressed by the ability for this group to bring people together from all walks of life, hundreds of organizations, including nonprofit, municipal, corporate, and thousands of individuals to address our community's toughest challenges. This work is not possible without organizations like Virginia Beach City Public Schools and their employees by what they do every day in their jobs, but also giving back their time, their talents, and their treasures. Today we're here to celebrate you, Virginia Beach City Public Schools, for your partnership and to honor your efforts during the annual campaign. We understand that the last few years have been challenging times for school systems, to say the least. Despite that, the employees of Virginia Beach City Public Schools and their students through student campaigns have continued to make giving back to their community a top priority. Just in the last few years, collectively, you all have donated more than 647000 to support local students and families through this campaign. 
This includes donations directly to hundreds of local nonprofit partners. This support was especially meaningful during COVID when many of these organizations struggled to stay open and continue serving the community due to canceled fundraising events. This campaign also allowed United Way to provide grants and collaborate, collaborate closely with organizations such as the Ability Center, YMCA of Southampton Roads, Beach Health Clinic, Boys and Girls Club, Catholic Charities, Equikids, Girls on the Run, Judeo-Christian Outreach, Mercy Medical Angels, Samaritan House, and many more so that they can continue serving our community during these trying times. This has also allowed us to launch a student needs funds at the school sites here and provide services through our Mission United and United for Children programs. Because of all of this, we're here today to present you with a 2022 Community Cares Award for your efforts and engagement, and we are so proud to continue to work closely with all of you and your amazing team. Congratulations to all. That includes our recognition portion of the evening. So that brings us to adoption of the agenda. Are there any modifications? Colleagues. Okay, hearing none, a motion to approve. Mrs. Riggs and a second. Mrs. Holtz, all in favor, show a raised hand, please. Madam Chair, we have unanimous vote. The motion did pass. Thank you. That brings us now to the superintendent's report, Dr. Spence. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman and members of the board. So here are just a few items of interest for you and our families to know this evening. <clears throat> First, Beach Girls Rock was held this past Saturday at Lansdowne High School. At this event, we had around 250 girls in grades 5 through 8 participate. This is an annual leadership empowerment event, and this workshop focused on leadership, college and career readiness, goal setting, and interpersonal skills. The young women at this event used a design model to discover hidden gems within themselves that will help them become future ready. They talked with each other about their talents, skills, and passions, and how to make a difference in this world. And they explored in those conversations the many fields of science, technology, engineering, and math. And during a networking session, Students learned how to have fun while learning more about their community. We want to especially thank Lansdowne staff and students for hosting this event. Teams from our Office of Family and Community Engagement, the Advanced Technology Center, the Technical and Career Education Center, and Human Resources were also represented at this event, as was our community partner, Operation Smile. Next, on October the 13th, we broke ground on yet another home being built by the extremely competent hands of our young people as a part of the House That Students Built project. I'm always impressed by the dedication, care, precision, and workmanship that's put into these homes, and I'm excited about what these all hands-on learning experiences mean for the future of our students who engage in this work. As you probably know, our technical, our technical and career education center students are putting in work every day, learning, developing, and putting into practice the critical trade skills that are preparing them for the workforce and high demand careers. Some of the students who are working on this project have already been hired by contractors, which is outstanding. I'd like to extend my sincere thanks to the Virginia Beach Education Foundation for their continued support. We're one of only three school divisions in Virginia with a project like this, and so we congratulate the students and the Education Foundation on that vision, and we wish best wishes to the students, teachers, and community partners who will be building this home from the ground up in the months ahead. Recently at the Convention Center on October the 13th, it was bustling with thousands of curious students and families wanting to learn more about our academies and advanced academic programs. Students and staff sharing information about unique offerings from all of our academies and programs were in place at the Convention Center to welcome interested students. And it was exciting to see the community engaging with current students and faculty to learn how our young people are exploring their interests through dynamic learning experiences. 
I can tell you that families shared with us their enthusiasm about all of the innovative programs that Virginia Beach City Public Schools has to offer. Recently, our Custodial and Food uh, Services Hiring Fair was a big success. That was held earlier this month at Green Run High School. The Office of Food Services interviewed over 40 candidates and recommended 34 for contracted positions and eight for substitutes. <clears throat> Custodial and Distribution Services interviewed 34 candidates and 30 of them were recommended for contract positions and four for substitute positions. Candidates at the fair told us that the hiring process was smooth and seamless. And I can tell you it was a true collaboration spearheaded by human resources, along with custodial and food services personnel. We are looking forward to these new team members that will come aboard as a result of this hiring fair. And then finally, we received news recently on three grants that will assist our ongoing efforts to provide a safe and secure learning environment for our students, staff, and our families first. We were awarded $562,485, which will go towards the fiscal year 23-24 school security officer grant program and fund. This money will be used to hire 15 new school security officer and security assistant positions for our elementary schools. The second grant is the 2022 school security equipment grant. That's a pending grant and it's a state grant for $124,760 which is sponsored by the Virginia Department of Education. That grant will be used to purchase digital two-way radios for selected schools and will fund the purchase and installation of surveillance cameras. That radio equipment is part of a phased process and will improve two-way communication, which we all know is a primary tool to share information in a school building. The third grant is the fiscal year 2022 Community-Oriented Policing Services and School Violence Prevention Program grant we were awarded $389,025 in federal funds. That's going to require a local match by VBCPS, but this federal grant is sponsored by the Department of Justice and the Bureau of Justice Assistance. This money will address a critical need for effective communications during an emergency or critical incident and will purchase and implement an integrated mass communications and emergency no notification system known as RAVE which will enhance the ability of individual schools and school division leadership to prepare for, respond to, and recover from emergency incidents. VBCPS is also partnering and coordinating with regards to this system with the City of Virginia Beach. Thank you, Madam Chair. That concludes my report. Thank you, as always. Thank you, as always, Dr. Spence. Okay, agenda item 11, public comment. The school board will now hear public comments. Uh, point of order, it's... Um Approval of the minutes, many minutes. minutes. Approval of the minutes. Agenda item 10. So this is the October 11th, 2022 regular school board meeting. Are there any modifications, colleagues? Okay, hearing none, a motion to approve. Mrs. Manning, a second. Mrs. Felton, all in favor, show a raised hand, please. We have nine ayes. Uh, abstentions? I'm abstaining because I left the meeting early. I'm abstaining because I was not present. So we have two abstentions, so the motion did pass, 902. Nine, Thank you, Madam Clerk. So the school board will now hear public comment on matters relevant to pre-K to 12 public education in Virginia Beach and the business of the school board and the school division from citizens and delegations who signed up with the school board clerk prior to noon today. In-person student speakers will be called first, followed by student speakers participating through Zoom or telephone. Uh, as always, the school board invites the public to submit comments through our group email account, which can be found on our website. So with that, Madam Clerk, would you please introduce the first speaker of the evening? Thank you, Madam Chair. Our first speakers are Emily Labar, Alex Estrat, and Savannah Newell. Welcome. Good afternoon. My name is Emily Labar, and I'm the president of First Colonial High School's Gender Sexuality Alliance. I'm here, along with many others, to speak against the 2022 model guidelines in defense of all students in Virginia Beach City Public Schools. We've come week after week, meeting after meeting, because this is important. 
We've spoken on the risks of these policies from suicide to abuse, so much so that I don't think there's a doubt in any of our minds that these policies will bring negative effects. We ask that a resolution be set and affirmed by unanimous vote to not enforce the 2022 model guidelines. We ask that this resolution assure all teachers and faculty members that they will never be fired or punished for calling a child by a preferred name or pronouns. We ask that counseling services are ready and available to all students. To ensure that all students, including transgender students, are protected and supported. Every effort should be made to ensure that a transgender student wishing to change their means of address is treated with respect, compassion, and dignity. As Thurgood Marshall once said, liberty cannot bloom amid hate. In the chill climate in which we live, we must go against the prevailing wind. We must dissent from the indifference. We must dissent from the apathy. We must dissent from the fear, the hatred, and the mistrust. We must dissent because America can do better, because America has no choice but to do better. Thank you for your time. Our next speaker is Alex Hestrot, Savannah Newell, and then Alexa Hernandez. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Alex Elster, and I'm a senior at First Colonial High School. At this point, I'm sure some of you may recognize me, as this is my third straight school meeting that I've attended, and the second in which I am speaking. I am here yet again to speak out against the Virginia Department of Education's model policy on transgender students, as you have yet to see this board take action to protect our students, and we are running out of time. The public comments section for this policy ends tomorrow, and soon upon that ending, you'll likely see this policy take effect and harm our students. So as a result of this proposed policy, see, our transgender and non-binary students would have to deal with repeated deadnaming and misgendering that would belittle them and disrespect their identities. Now, these may seem like menial issues to most. However, this can be life or death to those affected by these policies. A 2018 study by the Journal of Adolescent Health found that the consistent use of tra a trans child's affirmed name can reduce suicidal ideation by 29% and reduce suicidal behavior by 56%. We need this school board to take action before this policy is in our schools, forcing teachers and administrators to bend their knee to the state and disrespect their own students. We should not make teachers and faculty choose between being fired or punished or dead naming and misgendering their students. We should not make students have to choose between coming out to their unsupportive parents or hiding their true selves from everybody around them. These are choices nobody should have to make, and this body here can stop these choices from ever taking place in a Virginia Beach public school. For many, up to this point, schools have been a safe place for our trans and non-binary students. And getting rid of that safe place is truly scary for those of us that have friends that we are concerned for. The school board needs to act now by assuring that all students will be called by the preferred pronouns and names and that counseling will be available to every student who wants it. These are the bare minimum protections that we need to grant our students and this board needs to act now before it is too late. I would like to end this by stating that this is my third meeting. But until we see our trans students protected, it will not be our last. We will bring more people and make our voices heard, outstanding for our fellow students, until this body decides to take action ensure the rights of all students in Virginia Beach Public Schools are respected. Thank you. Our next speaker is Savannah Newell, then Alexa Hernandez, then Jay Runyon. Savannah Newell is not in attendance today. So can you identify yourself again? I'm Alexia Hernandez. Okay, welcome. My name is Alexia Hernandez. I'm a high school student, and while myself, I am not a transgender student, I will be speaking today on the behalf of one of my peers. Um, and this is what they wrote. I first came out as trans in my freshman year, and the only time people use my actual pronouns and name is when I'm at school. I engage in extracurricular activities with many people in the same situation as me, and having to hear words that don't describe you and being forced to respond to them is so incredibly disrespectful and just outright annoying. Some people only participate 
and school and extracurricular activities to get away from the disrespect they receive at home. The fact of the matter is some of our parents aren't supportive of their own children's identity for a variety of reasons, whether it's against their religion or it's just a phase or you're only trans because of television or peer pressure. This isn't about your beliefs. This is about your children trying to be happy, trying to be themselves. This is about making a place for kids to be themselves, whether they are bullied, where they aren't bullied or ignored. And for some kids, school is the only place where they can be themselves, and attempting to take that away from them is incredibly dangerous. Mental health in today's age is awful, especially due to the recent pandemic, and this policy will make everything worse for so many people who are already struggling. You don't know how hard it is to come to terms with the fact that you are different in every way that has people threaten your well-being. And there's no way around denying it and not having to announce it over and over again. When I first realized I was trans, my home life was terrible. I engaged in as many extracurriculars as possible to ignore everything and avoid going home. And that was happening either with myself or with my family. It was when I came to high school that I realized that if I continued down this path, I wouldn't be here to see my 18th birthday. People at school were supportive of me and made sure to refer to me the way they should and not what some piece of paper says. Now I'm 18. It was incredible to see that happen, but this policy may as well be a death sentence for trans youth who will be in a similar situation. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jay Runyon, then Natalie Gonzalez, then Gwyneth Icarus Landacker. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Jay Runyon, and I'm a high school student here in Virginia Beach. I'm here to voice my opinion against the model policy that will victimize transgender students. Being a gender nonconforming student myself, I know all too well the difference it makes to be accepted. It feels suffocating when people use she or her to address me, or when they use my legal name just because it was written on my birth certificate. In spite of the weight on my shoulders, I seldom told classmates around me how I felt. I had no idea the judgment or repercussions I might face if my parents learned about a new name. This fear of being outed followed me around like a dark cloud until the first day of junior year when a kind teacher asked, asked me for my preferred name and pronouns. Despite my fears, I told my teacher my name was Jay and that I used they, them pronouns. And it was the best decision I ever made. After that day, students and teachers alike started to address me by Jay and I began to grow more and more comfortable and confident in my own skin. With every passing day, the fog of fear that had encompassed my day-to-day -day life lessened. Finally, I had stopped hiding and I'd found a place where I felt like my true self. Now, imagine what would have happened if this policy had been in effect on that first day of junior year. I can guarantee you that my story and stories of transgender and gender non-conforming kids just like me would not have had a happy ending. Forget the dead naming. If I had been outed to my parents, I don't know what would have happened to me. 53% of trans students with accepting, staff at, with accepting staff said they felt safe at school, but this number dropped drastically to 18% for students who did not have the same support system at school. And even, stand, and even though standing here today and speaking to you all leaves a pit in my stomach, I believe that this policy is bigger than me. This proposed policy will hurt those I care about. It makes school an unsafe space, and I cannot stand by and watch it happen. The rate of suicidal ideation in transgender youth, as provided by the Trevor Project, is a terrifying 52%. I can guarantee you that we will see an even higher number here in Virginia Beach if this policy is passed. I ask you to please understand that this policy is morally and ethically wrong. Why should we allow transgender and queer students to become a part of a statistic simply because honoring their name and pronouns is too complicated? Students should not have to live in a cloud of fear, especially, seconds. especially in a building where their well-being and education should be put first. They should not have to worry about what name someone might address them by while trying to get through the school day. This is why I ask you to please, please not take part in enforcing this policy that could claim the lives of our transgender students and friends. Thank you. Our next speaker is Natalie Gonzalez, then Gwyneth Icarus Landacker, and then Anna Christina Oruch. Welcome. Hello, uh, my name is Natalie. 
and I am a senior at Kellum High School who, like my peers, will be voicing my opposition to the model trans policy. Can you step a little closer to the mic, perhaps, and just a little louder? Thank you. Yes, sorry. This policy manufactures an environment where denying a student's identity is not only allowed, but mandatory. Even with the more accepting policies of our previous governor, schools were imperfect in their inclusivity. According to New York State's Office of Children and Family Services, over 95% of LGBTQ youth have heard homophobic or transphobic slurs used in school, with 71% of transphobic remarks coming from school staff. Anecdotally, I've seen friends of mine get bullied to such an extent as to motivate them to graduate early or even change schools entirely, purely because they were trans. To accept these model policies is to observe all the flaws of the previous one, disregard them, and exacerbate them. A transgender student should not be excluded from basic respect and equal treatment. The intentions of these policies serve to delegitimize the identities of transgender children and ostracize them from their peers. Some might attempt to justify this mistreatment with reference to parental rights and their responsibility of the school to inform said parents. But the primary responsibility of a school is to ensure the welfare of a child with regard to their physical and mental health. What could possibly be more distressing for a transgender child than to be dead named, misgendered, or even worse, forcibly outed to an unaccepting family? To keep your students safe means that you must consider their home situation, but this policy advocates for a complete and utter rejection of nuance. Any sort of outing without the student's consent is a breach of trust. Shouldn't a school be the most understanding of how to provide support to their students? Trans kids deserve the space to feel comfortable and safe in their school environment, as do all students. Many of my closest friends are trans. They will be directly affected by these policies, yet many of them feel powerless to stop it. They cannot come and speak against these mandated outing of students' gender identities without outing themselves to their families. And if they could speak, they fear that their words would not be taken seriously. They are used to softening themselves, molding their identities into pretty digestible shapes. They are used to omitting chunks of who they are from others for their own safety at the expense of their own well-being. I am lucky enough to be seen as a woman. I know that that vital part of who I am, my womanhood, will be respected. That shouldn't be a luxury, and it shouldn't only be afforded to people like me. I want the same to be said for everyone, trans or not. Thank you. Our next speaker is Gwyneth Icarus Landacker, then Anna Christina Oroch, and then Jada Holt Corpru. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Icarus Landacre, and I am a senior at Princess Anne High School. The last time I was here, I addressed views of mine and my fellow peers on the proposed trans policy bill. I will be furthering my argument by bringing the voices of my friends Andrew and Ozen. The words spoken tonight are not for transgender students or trans allies. Instead, these words are for those who dismiss our identities as phases of mental illness and paint the support we receive as unhealthy, deceitful lies. The speeches tonight are directed toward those who support this policy. I was 16 when I changed my name, but only 13 when I was diagnosed with depression. Those uneducated on the topics will assume my transition is the source of my unhappiness, but that simply is not true. In fact, seeing my name on paper and hearing it said from my loved ones has done more for my happiness than any medication I have ever been on. When I said my name to my mother for the first time, I had only a moment of relief before I watched the look of pure disgust wash over her face. Every anxiety and intrusive thought served back, surged back to the surface, drowning me in her disapproval. Andrew was 12 years old when he began transitioning, his first step cutting his hair. I was 16 when I did the same. The act of cutting one's hair may seem insignificant, irrelevant even, but to us it meant the world. For the first time, our, appearance, our appearances finally reflected who we were, just like our names and pronouns. But with that came the crude remarks of why do you never wear dresses or why is your hair short? At 12 years old, my friend Andrew already had doubts on his self-image because of this. I was lucky in the sense I got to wait until I was 16 to face the same critiques, but I still faced them. And while they had the support of their family, I had a home where I felt like nothing and no one. As such, school has become my safe haven. It is where I went when I was too afraid to face my parents. School is where I went for the comfort of my teachers who welcomed me and lent me a shoulder to cry on. I never knew it was possible for a face to hurt so much from smiling. I never knew it was possible for someone to lose their voice or that 
for someone to lose their voice from laughing too much or that one could look in a mirror and be happy with what they saw. Through my teachers, I have found support and acceptance in all of this that I have never found from anyone else. However, this policy would take that away from students 30 like seconds. me by requiring teachers not to use the preferred pronouns of a student without parental approval. This policy would strip away any comfort students would have in confiding in their teachers. I am not sick because I dress closer to a boy than a girl. My friend is not sick because he goes by their name Andrew. We are not sick because we wear suits instead of sundresses or prefer the pronouns he or they as opposed to she and her. We are not sick because we are transgender. We are sick because we are not accepted, loved, or And that is time. Our next speaker is Anna Christina Oroch, Jada Hold Corpru, and then Miranda Lillian White. Hello. Uh, Hi. Identify yourself. I'm Anna Christina. Okay. Welcome. Hello. I'm Anna Christina, a junior at Princeton High School. And I wanted to comment on a conviction of mine concerning Governor Youngkin's model policy. For a while, I felt a moral obligation at school to use others' preferred pronouns for respect. In the bathrooms, I see respecting trans students is suicide prevention in the stalls. Then I realized there hasn't been a mental health crisis and suicide epidemic in LGBT until recently. I found a way to respect people without needing to change the way I've always spoken and without changing my worldview to fit each person differently. But when the topic does come up, I feel like you're not allowed to disagree with LGBT without being considered a horrible person. Using pronouns is not a simple courtesy because it affirms the idea you can change your gender. There is a saying, the iron of a file can make a blade sharper and a good friend can make a friend better. There's a fear going against the grain, but talking to human beings with our differences, without condemnation, without politics, but with healthy amounts of judgment is crucial for the school setting and especially the real world. Legally, people tend to change their name at 18. However, I don't find an issue in changing a name because that can vary. Kids younger and younger will start learning about LGBT with YouTube and TikTok. So in schools, it's only right we don't confuse children and place them in an uncomfortable position where they have to go against their peers or themselves. How come someone thinks they're in the wrong body but not in the right mind? Or, or, but in the right mind. Why shouldn't we give an anorexic person a gastric band if they think they need to be skinnier? Otherwise, it's discrimination. It's a free country to live and express yourself and how you want. But when it, con when it concerns minors, peers, this is not always appropriate for adults to support. What the child believes is not always what um, parents have a responsibility. And sometimes they need to go against the grain. Also in Richmond, Delegate Guzman wants to follow in Canada's footprints and bring CPS charges to parents who don't affirm their child. After an investigation, they could be taken away or arrested, as with Robert Hoogland in Canada. I truly care for the friends I've talked to over the years struggling with this dilemma, yet the world is changing in a way that will hurt this generation more than we could ever know. 30 seconds. If one is truly in an extremely abusive household, then the person responsible, of course, should be reported depending on the scenario. But if it's because the parent's belief differ from the child's belief, there shouldn't be a criminal charge. Disagreement is not violence, and failing to use pronouns is not the same as assault. Being near peoples won't threaten their existence nor safety. We can all learn to be more accepting of who we are and how we came into this world. That's part of growing up. And so, that is time. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jada Holt Corpru, Miranda Lillian White, and then Alana Spencer. Good evening. Good evening. Um, my name is Jada Holt. I am a student at First Colonial High School, and I'm surprised here to talk about the transgender um, legislation proposal. Um, in my 12 years as a VPCPS student, I've encountered many different people, um, a majority being a part of the LGBTQ community. Um, some of my best friends are gender non-conforming or non-binary non or transgender, and I have personally seen the harm that being dead named has done to them. Um, 
I have comforted my friends in and out of school in the, as the result of them being dead named by teachers in Virginia Beach. Um, and I have cried with them as they have contemplated ending their lives due to the fear of being judged or the fear of being attacked due to what they believe. Um, school is meant to be a safe place for all students alike. The fear of being judged by peers for something that they cannot control is already an issue trans students face. Um, having to worry about being dead named or outed by staff will not, would cause more unneeded stress and harm, but also may be a student's final breaking point. Um, since the majority of them don't have at-home support, school is their only safe space. Informing parents of their ch child's gender identity would, without their consent or knowledge of the student only takes away their, not only takes away their safety, but also causes them a great amount of dis mental distress and suffering. Though it is important that we include parents in what happens in schools, I believe we should also take into account that not all parents are accepting of their students, of their children, and the enforcement of this bill would take away the safe space that many of us have. Instead of alienating our <laughs> instead of alienating students, I feel as though we should try to be more accepting and understanding and open our minds to what they have to say. Not only that, I feel as though we should also take into account that bullying is an issue that's more important than how it, what, a, what name a student would like to be called. And I feel as though we should address the real issues. Thank you. Hope you guys have a nice day. Our next speaker is Miranda Lillian White, Alana Spencer, and then Geneva Weirin. Good evening. Good evening. Um, <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, my name is Miranda White. I am 17 years old. I am a junior at the LSA Academy at First Colonial High School, and I'm here to talk to you today about how counselors are a vital and part of the learning environment. Uh, my journey with mental health starts all the way back in sixth grade. Um, through that time period, I was um, I was admitted to a hospital for about five months. I was not able to do schoolwork like every other kid. My school hours were slim from six hours to one. And during that, my school counselor at the time, they helped me figure out how to navigate being a student and also working on myself at the same time. Through the years, I have faced many challenges with my own mental health. I'm still striving to be a better me as of today. But in the past year, um, my school counselor currently, Ms. Tomeo, uh, I'm extremely grateful for her because she has served my family in ways that are unimaginable. Both me and my family are extremely grateful for the services that she's provided and how she's made this ease of navigating both school and health at the same time. She's helped me both uh, She's helped me both navigate school during treatment and be able to stay on task and learn some similar things to that they're learning in class. She's also not only helped me with school, but with an emotional part. During the school day, there'd been times where I would not be doing so well and I would feel comfortable to be able to come to her office and talk to her how I was feeling. To have someone that, to have someone like that in a school environment for me is an extremely important part. Being trapped in one's own mind and thoughts is, is so scary. It's almost unimaginable to defer what happens from person to person. And being able to share and let those thoughts out with a person you trust is incredibly important to me and many other people. I am incredibly grateful, I can't say it enough, for my school counselor and to be able to speak to her and be comfortable. Thank you. Our next speaker is Alana Spencer and then Geneva Warren. Welcome. Thank you. My name is my name is Alana Spencer and I am a sophomore at First Colonial High School and I'm speaking on behalf of my friend Jake who unfortunately couldn't speak today. I was lying in my bed at about 1 a.m. trying to fall asleep. I had a stressful day of sprinting through schoolwork and trying to get my speech done. So I should have fallen asleep in an instant, yet I still laid awake. I laid awake because I was trying to think of exactly what I wanted to say today. I wanted to communicate why I have to be here and why I, kept, I still kept writing over the weekend, 
even though I had a fever that at one point hit 101 and almost sent me to urgent care. Then it all hit me over the head like a ton of bricks. I have to keep writing because what, it, what is happening now isn't enough. It isn't enough to just hear that things went well for my peers and sit on the sidelines. It isn't enough to simply hope that this board decides to do the right thing. It isn't enough to show your support with a sticker of a pride flag or a school sponsoring of LGBT plus history month. It will only be enough when my friends are safe to walk through the halls of my school and be themselves. Every school board meeting that passes without change, without something on the agenda, proves to me that I'm not doing enough and I will not stop until I have done enough. I lay awake at night thinking about all my friends who might suffer because of this policy. The numbers 40 and 56 keep lurking in my mind. The 40% of trans youth who have attempted suicide and the 56% in suicidal behavior if we simply use a child's preferred name. There's no excuse for both myself and this board to not take every action we can to give trans youth the most basic of respect and quite possibly save their lives. And until we do, my efforts will not be enough. Another number bounces in my head as well. 45. The Trevor Project estimates that queer youth attempt suicide every 45 seconds. Until I don't have to wonder every 45 seconds if my, friend, if my friends are all right, my efforts will not be enough. With trans youth under such tremendous pressure and hate, all of us, especially the schools, need to apply just as much care and compassion onto them as possible. That's why I'm here today, to show my friends that I have their backs. I'll leave you with the words of Dr. Martin Luther King. We'll be extremists for hate or love. We'll be extremists for the preservation of injustice or the extension for injustice or for the extension of justice. Board members, that choice lies in your hands. Thank you. Our next speaker is Geneva Waring. Okay, we'll move on. Our next speakers will be Nat Bazinet, Terry Stevens, and then Donald Labar. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Nat Bazinet, and I am a graduate of Kemp High School, and I graduated in 2015. I'm here today to speak out against the new model policy that has been proposed and demand that our school, our school board protect transgender students. During my time at school, I was identifying with the gender I was assigned at birth, and I was still targeted and harassed in a school bathroom. I was threatened by this person as well. When I brought this issue to the attention of a school counselor, nothing was done. I had to continue to go to school and operate in a place of fear, knowing I wasn't protected. And I stand here today proud and comfortable in my trans identity, and I want to request that the school board do something to help these students and not enforce a policy that will create a school environment like I had, where I was not protected. So, thank you. Our next speaker is Terry Stevens, then Donald Labar, then Sarah Gerloff. Good evening. Good evening, members of the school board. My name is Terry Stevens. I have two children who graduated from a public high school in Virginia Beach. In addition to receiving a fine academic education, both were afforded community service opportunities as part of their National Honor Society memberships. I am here to encourage you to allow all students guided participation in developing community knowledge and support by offering a high school elective in service learning. Service learning is a teaching method that combines meaningful service to the community with curriculum based learning. Typically, service learning projects will meet a need in the community, help develop student responsibility, establish community partnerships, and equip students with knowledge and skills. We would join other jurisdictions in Virginia and our nation with very successful service learning curriculum. Since 1997, Maryland requires every student to participate in service learning. However, they started in the 1980s with service learning as an elective. Community projects there have addressed such needs as hunger, homelessness, illness, and pollution, to name a few. Service learning is a win-win for the community and students. 
Each year in Maryland, the graduating class of approximately 59,000 students provides the greater community with approximately 4 million hours of service. According to the Maryland Department of Education, benefits of service learning include academic engagement, civic responsibility, problem solving, and pragmatic application of academic knowledge to real world issues. In addition, during service learning, students are able to explore a variety of career options. By engaging in these experiences, students gain a better understanding of their hometown. They use a hands-on approach to apply what they are learning in the classroom to help solve existing community problems. In Virginia Beach, some examples of service learning may include studying flooding and implementing solutions, starting a tutoring program for younger students, designing artwork or comfort items for children at a local hospital, studying sustainability and encouraging the community to engage, identifying senior citizen needs in our city, or working seconds. with horticulturists to start community gardens. I sincerely hope that you will encourage our school district to research and implement a service learning elective in our area, starting perhaps with a pilot program or one or two of our high schools. Thank you for this time. Thank you for your time this evening and for serving your elected positions. The clerk has my contact information if any of you are interested in further information. Thank you. Our next speaker is Donald Labar, then Sarah Gerloff, then Catherine Maui. Welcome. Thank you. My name is Donald Labar. I'm here to talk about the 2022 model guidelines. When I went to school, I asked my teachers to call me Donnie. They didn't have to worry about getting into trouble for calling me by my preferred name. They also didn't have to call my parents. I grew up in Illinois and only moved to Virginia Beach as an adult. I was stationed here during my service in the Navy. I have three daughters, two of them currently in Virginia Beach Public Schools, one recently graduated. Every day for the past 13 years, I would send them to school, trusting they would be safe, respected, and treating, treated with compassion by teachers and staff. I know many other parents have done the same. If the 2022 model guidelines were adapt, adopted, this would all change. James 4.12 says, there is only one lawgiver and judge, the one who is able to save and destroy, but you, who are you to judge your neighbor? Who are we to go against our own ideals of respect and compassion? No matter what name we call them, no matter whether they are respected or treated with compassion, they will be the same person. Not calling a child by their preferred name and pronouns isn't gonna change them. It's not gonna make, it's going to make them safe. My wife and I raised our three daughters to advocate for themselves and others. One of our daughters spoke before you today, along with a dozen of her brave, empathetic, and determined peers. These students feel strongly enough to keep coming here week after week to show you that seeking growth, being open to change, and valuing, valuing diversity is important to the student body. You have, to show, you have the power to show them that BB CPS aims to provide an equitable education and a safe learning environment for all, all its students. Thank you. Our next speaker is Sarah Gerloff, then Catherine Malley, then Gina Alberi. Welcome. Thank you. The mind is very powerful. We manifest the world with our thoughts, words, and actions, whether it be a positive heaven or a negative hell. As guides to God's precious children, we as adults are supposed to lead by positive example in order to teach the positive and thus create a heaven on earth. When we teach wrong, such as it's okay to lie because we do not want to hurt another's feelings, then we teach false light because a lie is never truth. This begins the creation of a false upside down wrong world. Our laws, which come from our creator, are based on common sense. By teaching false light, we teach nonsense and create a lawless society like the one we have today. For every crime or problem, there must be an equal remedy, a solution, a balance of justice. We the people have a problem. Our elected representative, representatives have been violating God's supreme law of the land and leading others astray. Members of this school board, along with your appointees, have repeatedly infringed upon our unalienable God-given rights, violating real laws, trespassing against us. 
You have infringed upon our liberty to make choices for our children. You have infringed upon our right to free and truthful speech. You have misappropriated our money by spending it on things that do not benefit our children. You have aided in the transfer and distribution of obscene books filled with pornography, pedophilia, and vulgar sex acts. You have recreated problems by focusing on negatives, such as racism, instead of focusing on the positive and that we have mostly overcome racism. You are teaching that lying is compassion by allowing and promoting the use of preferred pronouns. All of these acts have caused damage to our souls and those of our children. We are not to judge on the superficial, but instead on the content of one's character. The content of your character has become dark. All matter is energy. You have become negative ions, creating a wrong world. You are a big part of the problems we have because you have caused damage to the minds of children, as we can see already. In order to teach our children a valuable lesson, we must turn this negative into a positive by applying the proper solution, seconds. the law. We must teach our children that there are consequences for wrong actions and that no one is above the law. You have stolen innocence and happiness from children. You have infringed upon their time, their childhood. The solution is t your time, prison time, and your debt is due. It's so interesting how some fear the truth so much, but it is the truth that shall set us all free. Our next speaker is Catherine Malley, then Gina Olveri, and then Steve Brandis. Good evening. Good evening, school board members and Dr. Spence. My name is Katherine Malley. I am a retired teacher and current member of the VBEA board. Students aren't the only ones who need more time to learn. Teachers also need more and better time for learning and planning. I am going to be quoting from professional literature about the importance of planning time. This article, Time for Teacher Learning, Planning, Critical for School Reform, was written in 2016, six years ago. What's the difference now? A global pandemic that has upended education and required teachers to master new technologies and navigate increased student behavior challenges, all while addressing learning loss. The main difference now, May Day. Lack of planning time is causing teachers to abandon their profession readily. Burnout, even at two months, into the school year is rampant. Even more teachers will be walking away, some before the year ends. Teachers cannot do their job without earmarked planning time. Planning time is the number one complaint we hear from our members in the Virginia Beach Education Association. This is not new information. However, it is critical information for this day and time. Planning time, both individual and collaborative, has been an ongoing problem for years. Virginia Beach School Administration can no longer turn a blind eye to this vital need. Due to the time constraints of this speech, I have emailed some suggestions to the school board and administration to address the planning time problem. Teachers have been asked to think outside the box and provide all hands on deck. The current lack of planning time for teachers is not sustainable, not feasible, and not meeting VBCPS goals of putting students first. You cannot put students first by putting teachers last. Thank you. Our next speaker is Gina Olveri, Steve Brandis, and then Carol Kingsey. Welcome. I'm not as prepared as everyone else, but I'm Gina Oliveri. I've um, graduated from ODU. I have a master's degree in education, and I taught uh, math and science for the city of Virginia Beach. For, Can you step up a little bit? Okay, I'm sure. Taught at the city of Virginia Beach for since 1993, on and off. I had kids. I'd stop full time, part time. I love our school system. I was always so proud, still, that I worked there for. Okay. While I was in college, I also worked at Norfolk Psych on the acute children's unit for three years, all through um, my college years. And 
the acute unit is when the students come in and they've been, you know, physically abused, sexually abused, and things would stabilize them and send out here. I work with all levels of um, professionals in the in that social structure, um, art therapists, counselors, psychiatrists, whatever. It's, I, I, it's probably not the right time to talk, but the sexualizing of this gender stuff that's going on is dangerous to young exposure at young ages to some of this sexualizing um, um, acts that are going on in some of these books that are in our library is dangerous for young cool not even just young kids they would when, when children are sexually molested at young ages I'm not saying they're kids that's those first hormonal surges and visions that's what it takes to have to to get aroused as they get older so if you're showing children these like gender queer and some other you wouldn't take a playboy or a hustler and lay out a bread eagle because it it, it evokes feelings and then that's what these kids feel the need to have to do as they get older and just from my own experience is this you shouldn't sexualize children at a young age that's my whole point is i have nothing against transgenders i don't think transgenders should be sexualized so young either that it's it's a it, i saw that gender queer on the internet so i was like oh whatever not a big deal on the internet then i was like oh anybody can get things on the internet but then I went to a dinner party and someone had 30 it. seconds. And the details and the graphicness of the, how in depth it went into how to use inanimate objects and all these things, it's bizarre. It's too much. Children don't need to see that. Even, even high school kids, let them become naturally, however, and as they get older, then introduce those things. But having that stuff, it's, it's kind of too much right now. That's all. And I, I have lots of experience. So. And that is time. Our next speaker is Steve Brandis and then Carol Kinsey. Good evening. Good evening. Hi, uh, I, I'm Steve Brandis. I'm, I'm here to uh, speak about the cell phone policy implementation, specifically with the middle schoolers. I just want to start by saying thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your service. And especially thank you to those of you who uh, took the time to respond, I really appreciate that. Um, so I, I just want to remind, the, the fact is currently we are forcing our students to surrender their phones to a locker against their will, and I find that this is beyond the, the scope of the, the cell phone policy that you took the time to carefully adopt. Um, so I stand before you just asking your assistance to, to help course correct that, that we enable a parent or, or a student or child an emergency a capability for emergency uh, communication um, you know all I'm asking is, is is help us follow our policy let's have the teachers identify the, the space in, inside the instruction instructional setting as the policy states and let's grant them that 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 precious uh, ability to, to make an emergency call so again I just ask all of you Take a time, reread re my email, but, but get off the fence, please. You know, just decide. Are, are, are you standing here, an organization willing to proudly follow the policies you've taken time to, to write? Or are you just going to sit by and collaborate while we discriminate against our middle schoolers based solely on their age? What we're doing, um, it, 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 it doesn't have to be difficult, or what I'm asking to be done. So let's put this into context. I just ask each of you to remember 9-11, 2001. Imagine you're on that plane and things aren't going well and you just want to call home, call your loved ones. Those calls, we heard them, man. It, it, they were sad, but I'm so thankful they had a phone available. They could make that last call. And I ask you to help make that possible. It's a simple ask. And did anyone watch the news last night or this morning? You know. We had another tragic mass shooting. It was one of 20 something so far. There was metal detectors, locked doors, seven security guards. It happened anyway, despite all of our best plans. It's gonna happen again. 
So I'm here for myself, for other parents. Seconds. Just help me make this possible. And, and, and I've heard the excuses, but you know, middle schoolers, if, if they can thwart your emergency response, then you need a better plan. We know you got walkie talkies and direct lines to the emergency communication center. You got phone numbers that aren't 911. There's not enough students to jam up the cell service. This is not applicable to our high schoolers. So it's not too late to start doing the right thing. Please take a moment. Help and that is Thank time. You. Our next speaker is Carol Kinsey. Good evening. Good evening. <clears throat> I'm Carol Kinsey. This is in regards to school board regulation 5-7.0.1. Nothing is more disturbing than to observe a school system which has so many wonderful initiatives continuously choose policies which lead through a devious path of educational disruption, dismantling, and transformation, all in the name of diversity. Some of you don't have educational degrees, but you know right from wrong. Some of you have degrees in education, and you still don't know right from wrong. There is a distinct difference between educating our children with basic academics as opposed to manipulating, indoctrinating, and poisoning them with your worldly programs, which you initially said you weren't teaching. Then the said programs showed up on state and local websites and now are embedded in the curriculum. You are responsible for teaching academics to our greatest act assets, our children. They're impressionable, whether they are five years old or 18. Conformity is doing what everyone else is doing, regardless of what is right. Morality is doing what is right, regardless of what everyone else is doing. Now, with this regulation 5-7.1 becoming quite visible to the public, you are further alienating the parents, which you're saying you're not doing. They have the fundamental right to make decisions concerning the upbringing, the education, and the care of their children. That's Virginia Law Code 1-240.1. You don't get to substitute your values for parental values, nor interfere in the children's <coughs> upbringing. History will not look kindly on our school system, one that I taught in for 41 years. History will not look kindly on our school system for the last few years, and neither will God. Thank you. Okay, Madam Chair, our online speaker is not online, so that ends the speakers for this evening. All right, thank you, Madam Clerk, and thank you to all our speakers. So, uh, agenda item 12 uh, brings us to the information portion of the meeting. And we, get, we begin with interim financial statements for September, and our presenter is Mr. Dan Hopkins, our Director of Business Services. Welcome, sir. Thank you. Good evening, Chairwoman Rye, Vice Chairwoman Melnick, school board members, Dr. Spence. As of September 30th, the overall revenue trend remains acceptable at this point in the fiscal year. Our September 30th enrollment came in at 63,598, and this is higher than our projected ADM of 63,365 used to build the budget for state revenue. There aren't any projected state changes in the state revenue at this time. Federal revenues are showing an acceptable trend as of the end of September. We have a received impact aid payments of approximately $5 million year to date. Other sources of revenue through the month are acceptable at this point in the fiscal year. They are up about $300,000 from last year, mainly due to summer school tuition. This next graph shows that sales tax receipts are at an acceptable level at this point in the fiscal year. We have received approximately $5.2 million higher or more than the same time period last year. 
And the last graph shows that the expenditures and encumbrances trend continues to remain acceptable at this point in the fiscal year. Um, this concludes my presentation. I'll be glad to take any questions. Anybody? Mrs. Manning. Thank you. I have a question on the budget transfers. Um, it compiles a bunch of different line items, but it totals about $400,000 in transfers for temporary employees. What are those employee positions? You're saying $400,000? Total, um, yeah, it's to support funding for temporary employee TEA requests, and it's a line item several different times. If you add it all up, it's a, approximately, I just did it in my, you know, in my head here. I will have to look that one up for you because I really don't know what those budget transfers Dr. are for. Dr. Spence, do you know what those are for? There are a variety of different positions that go across uh, departments and uh, oftentimes are school-based positions. There are those temporary contracts that we have for employees who fulfill different needs that we don't have permanent positions for. So we have, um, I don't know, Ms. Woodhouse, you want to speak to the, the list that we have of temporary employees? Yes, actually, um, primarily we use TEAs to bring back um, retired administrators who fill in when we have principals or assistant principals out for extended time. Um, we also bring back um, in mainly retired employees to help support, whether it be for professional development, mentorship, or special projects. Um, but majority definitely goes towards, uh, I call it substitute coverage, for our administrators when they're out. Okay, so to me, I mean, if this is, if we're transferring a budget transfer, then this is over what we had originally budgeted and we're, where we just have more need for it. Is that? Yeah, that's correct. Yes, that's, that's correct. And, oh, sorry. Um, and actually what we are trying to keep that budget in alignment with TEAs that are coming across for the year, which are probably more than we've normally seen at first. And so we are trying to keep the budget in alignment so that stays in the personnel category versus maybe sitting in an other contracted services or materials and supply line. So we are trying to watch those TEAs as they're coming through for approval and keeping that budget in line by category. It just makes it better for us to keep track of the budget as we move forward and the budget gets constrained by different, um, different expenditures that are on our budget right now. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, we thank you. Thank you. Information item B is the fiscal year 21-22 budget resolution regarding reversion and revenue sharing formula. Welcome, Ms. Pate. Good evening, Chairwoman Rye, Vice Chairwoman Melnick, school board members, and Dr. Spence. I'm going to summarize a presentation that we gave in workshop a, a few out, a couple hours ago. Um, we're just going to reiterate it now at the formal meeting. So this presentation is a summarization of our fiscal year end 2022 unaudited reversion funds and the revenue sharing formula reconciliation between the city and schools. Um, as mentioned, we did do an initial presentation of information to the Planning and Performance Monitor Committee on October 10th. This first slide is a breakdown of the school division's reversion funds. The first line of approximately $15.7 million represents the school operating fund reversion, excluding any of the revenue variances for the fiscal year and excluding debt service. As you can see, this reversion amount represents 1.8% of the school's operating budget. As you may recall from prior year's presentations, our practice is to have a reversion amount at the end of the fiscal year that is approximately 2% of the operating budget. We believe that this is a conservative approach in executing our operating budget. It is generally accepted practice in government budget budgeting to not spend to zero so that we can ensure that we leave some funding available for unanticipated costs, such as increase in fuel, utilities, and costs associated with weather-related events not completely covered by insurance, etc. The second line shows unexpended debt service of approximately $3.7 million. As you know, the city issues any related debt for the school division. This unexpended amount is a result of not having a bond sale as originally planned and therefore the debt service to be paid was less than budgeted. The school division's total revenue for fiscal year 2022 from all sources came in over budget and resulted in a total variance of approximately $938,000. As noted in the past, our budget is built on state, federal, and local projections. This additional revenue was not appropriated by the city. 
Therefore, we were not authorized to spend the funds. We do not request appropriations for additional funding unless we are certain we are to receive it. And this revenue is simply where actual revenue exceeded the revenue projections. The $938,000 is comprised of federal revenue coming in over budget by approximately $3.6 million, mainly due to impact aid receipts and Medicaid reimbursements. As reported during the, during the interim financial statements for the year in June 30, 2022, at the September 27th board meeting, state revenue came in under budget by approximately $20.6 million as a result of lower than projected March 31st ADM, coupled with a significant increase in sales tax revenue, which has an inverse relationship with the basic aid revenue source. It's not a one-to-one -one relationship, but for every dollar increase in sales tax, basic aid decreases by about 60 cents, and this is based on our composite index. Sales tax revenue came in over budget by approximately $16.3 million, and other revenue came in over budget by approximately $1.6 million, mainly due to the stop arm program, the sale of capital assets, buses and vehicles, and indirect costs on grants. In addition, the Athletic Fund had a reversion of approximately $296,000, and Green Run Collegiate had a reversion of approximately $409,000. The combination of figures I just covered and listed here on this slide bring the total fiscal year 2022 unaudited reversion to $21,071,766. This $21.1 million represents the reversion solely for the school division based on our appropriated funds for the school operating budget, the athletic fund, and Green Run Collegiate as approved by City Council. We want to reiterate once again, so it is understood by not only school board members and city council, but also for the viewing public, that in the state of Virginia, unexpended local funds in any year shall remain a part of the funds of the governing body appropriating the funds for the use the next year. As you know, we have a revenue sharing agreement with the city. The language in the first bullet on this slide comes directly from the city school revenue sharing policy. If at the end of the fiscal year, the actual non-dedicated local tax revenues differ from the budgeted non-dedicated local tax revenues, and if such funds, excess funds, are not required for the city's general fund balance reserve policy, the school board may request that such funds be appropriated at the same time as the appropriation of reversion funds. Also note if city revenue, revenues included in the revenue short formula underperform, the shortage is taken as part of the year-end true-up process. The initial revenue sharing formula reconciliation between the city and schools resulted in additional revenue to the school division of approximately $25.6 million. On October 19th, we were informed by the city that they had some changes to accrued utility tax revenue and some formula changes they need to make to the revenue sharing formula reconciliation. We received an update to the reconciliation late yesterday afternoon, and it is now coming in at $27,222,401, which is approximately $1.6 million higher than the initial, amounts pre the initial amount previously presented to PPMC. This slide reflects the school division's fiscal year 2022 reversion of the $21,071,766, as well as the city's revised revenue sharing formula true up of $27,222,401. So the unaudited total funding available for reappropriation is $48,294,167, which reflects the additional $1.6 million. Recall from prior discussions that we view these funds to be used for one-time expenditures, not for ongoing expenditures such as raises. This next slide lays out the initial proposed spending plan presented to PPMC. We have not altered this proposed spending plan for the additional $1.6 million. Um, we expect that further discussions and among school board members will decide whether how that additional money will be um, allocated and if this proposed spending plan will go forward as stated here. It's, right now it shows we propose spending 96% of the original amount for reappropriation on our capital improvement program or our CIP program. As I just mentioned, it's not the total amount for reappropriation was at $1.6 million higher. We do not recommend putting this additional funding. We do recommend putting this additional funding into the CIP program. And again, we expect further discussion on these recommendations to occur prior to taking final action on this resolution. So to review this slide, uh, the $3,746,765 is the amount of unexpended debt service I mentioned earlier and is PAYGO funding to replace authorized but unissued PRFB bonds. 
This reduces future debt service. The $5,572,862 is PAYGO funding to offset the state construction grant revenue, which came in under budget. As you recall, in the superintendent's six-year capital improvement plan, uh, the, the governor's office at that time gave us an estimate of $21,396,675. When the General Assembly concluded their session, that amount came in at $15,823,813, so basically leaving a funding hole in that CIP program, so we're just putting that money back. The remaining funding going into CIP, CIP is being split between the four CIP projects listed on the slide. Princess Anne High School at $10 million, the Betty F. Williams Bayside 6 project at $7 million, Bayside High School um, at $4,332,881, and the payroll system replacement at $3 million. Again, that payroll system, system replacement is a new project from last year. We have an initial estimate about $14 million. It'll take us in about five to seven years to replace that system, and we're trying to stay on track with funding that, that project so we have that money when implementation needs to take place. Um, again, this is an effort to put cash into the CIP program to assist in future, um, reducing future reliance on debt. The $11 million is the amount presented in the CIP approved budget to be allocated from reversion. The city has to put this into our school reserve special revenue fund for use in the 2024 CIP. And we have placed this funding currently into the HVAC phase three at 9.2 million and renovations and replacements re-roofing at 1.8 million. The remaining 2 million is to go to our risk management fund as mentioned in the interim financial statement presentation to you on September 27th. We had an incident at Holland Road Annex, and we incurred a relatively large claim, which reduced the fund balance in risk management. And this recommendation is just to restore a large portion of that reduction in fund balance. The last few slides of this presentation is just a draft resolution. Again, is that is of the original reversion amount and not including the 1.6 million. Um, as the board weighs in and has further discussion on the recommendations, um, we will revise the budget resolution to be brought back to you for action on November 9th. And again, we would ask that any additional recommendations for consideration be presented as soon as possible so we can finalize that budget resolution. And that concludes the presentation, and I'll be happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you, Ms. Pate. So we have in the queue uh, Mrs. Melnick and then Mrs. Anderson. Okay, so reducing our reliance on debt is obviously very important, and we need to show City Council that with this excess that we will be applying that towards our CIP, which there was also a hole created um, on the state level also. I get that. But we also talked about um, today in the workshop three hours ago um, that um, the possibility of a, of a one-time bonus for our teachers, and I know um, it, it is very, and I mentioned this earlier, it is difficult to look at these numbers and say, how do we have the money for this and not that? And, um, you know, building buildings is, it, it, it costs a lot of money. Yeah, it's very expensive. So um, just to satisfy my own my own um, needs here, what what would it cost if we gave our employees a thousand dollar bonus? Um, well, if well you, first of all, if you all, did all, it would be about ten point one million dollars. Right. So, <clears throat> if all employees, because you recall, there is going to be a one thousand dollar bonus for all employees. Um, part of that is coming through the state budget for SOQ positions, and part of that is going to be funded through our ESSER funding. Okay, so that's so, at Christmas time. So that's a okay. yes, All that's right. trying to be right. will be for rent or break, and that right now with FICA will be a little over eleven million dollars for all employees. Okay. All right. That's that's a large number. Okay. Yeah. Krista, what was the amount for just teachers? Because I know that was brought up as well. So for just teachers for a thousand dollars, and this is based on an early estimate of about five thousand two hundred and forty-five teachers, and so that number obviously will vary, um, and we'll get that updated from HR if that's the direction the board would like to go. But using that number of teachers with FICA, it's about five mil five point seven million dollars with FICA okay. to give teachers a um, thousand dollar bonus. Okay, and. Um, the other question I asked is, um, so just restating for for the viewing public that 
no matter what we put in our resolution, this has to go to city council and city council has final say. They do, they, okay. they have to vote, yes. Okay, and I thank you. Mm -hmm. Hey, Mrs. Anderson. <clears throat> so I, I get that a uh, thousand dollar bonus. I'm talking about adding to what they're already, what we've already allocated for them to get. Okay, we know they're going to get a thousand dollars right before Christmas. What if we, if so, if we just added five hundred to that, so that teachers would get, teachers and counselors and teacher assistants would get fifteen hundred, not, not a thousand. So 1,500 <coughs> on the number of teachers I just quoted, and that's an HR number. Um, for 1,500 with FICA, it's going to be almost $8.5 million for 1,500. But, but we've already allocated 1,000. Okay, so you're just talking about the additional 500. Additional 500. So it would be just for the teachers, it would be half of the 5.7 million. <coughs> okay. All right. Um, and just for clarity, Ms. Anderson, because you mentioned teacher assistants, teacher assistants aren't included in that number. Mm -hmm. So we'd have, to, we'd have to go, no. Yeah, we Teachers includes, it's a specific category within our pay scale. It, and um, that would include classroom teachers. It also includes instructional specialists, and it would mm -hmm. include school counselors. And so that group of people together, and then we would have to further break that out if the interest was only in classroom teachers. Okay. So do we have a little time to think about this? I mean, we've got two weeks to... Well, we have two weeks before the board takes action. The request that you heard Crystal make and that we would make is that we would need at least three, four days in order to rewrite the resolution in time for you to take action on that at your next meeting on November the 9th. I, I'm just... I, I would just like to do something um, with, this, with this additional 1.6... Um, I realize that, you know, city council may say, well, we'd rather you just put all of it into, into CIP. I realize that. But at the same time, we do need to ensure that our teachers, especially teachers, because we're so shorthanded with teachers right now, but we're shorthanded with everything, not just teachers, mm -hmm. but teacher assistants, um, <coughs> cafeteria workers, bus drivers, et cetera. I just feel like we need to do something, though, especially for teachers right now, because it's a national problem as well. And I just think we need to, we need to utilize some of this 1.6 um, for our teachers and, and counselors. So um, I, I'd like to stick with that, but that, that's just my opinion right now. So it's 1.6 additional that we're getting, right? Yes. Right. So I'm sorry, there was a question about your last comment. Repeat that. No. Was it? It's just the 1.6 that I want to see us do something with. That would be a 1.6 additional million. 1.6 million additional that I'd like to see us do something with. Does everybody understand? <laughs> okay. Um, this is Manning. Slightly less than $250 yes. is what that would look like, just on a quick calculation. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, on top of the, the $1,000 that they're already getting, though. You no, know, I'm just giving you what I think the number is going to okay. be. Okay, all right, yeah. <clears throat> Okay, Mrs. Manning. So I could support um, giving that 1.6 million to our teachers. Um, I, I think right now any 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 anything helps. Um, but I also am thinking as we're pondering these numbers, I'm thinking about where this money has come from. This money has come from our taxpayers who are hurting right now, and you know people can't. Some people can't. It, it's whether or not they're going to pay their rent or their or their utility bill. And when we're short money, where do we go? We go to the taxpayer and say we need more. When we have excess funds, we never talk about giving it back to the taxpayer. City Council has funds um, in, in excess that is my understanding as well. That is correct. So if we, as a board, decided to give part of that money back to City Council and request that that go back to a tax refund and they do the same thing, um, that could really help our community. And that could in turn help our, our students, our teachers, our employees. Um, and so I, I would like to ask my colleagues on the board if you have um, any desire to, to look into that, to try to help our community. People are struggling right now. And um, I, I would like to, to put that out there for conversation.
Well, seeing no other hands, I'll comment for a moment. Uh, so we've never get. This is a lot. I mean, it's a very high percentage right now in the recommendations to give and to put into the CIP. It's over 90 percent, mm -hmm. correct? That's correct. I think back to the spring and the uh, the funds from the revenue sharing formula that <clears throat> that were otherwise allocated by city council, and so uh, for me to contemplate a thousand dollar additional bonus, it, it, ten, it was closer to ten or eleven million crystal for the for all employees. Yes. It's a, a little over eleven million. So that leaves just for the record the balance remaining be like 48 less 11 million so about 30 I don't do, I'm a calculator person sorry <laughs> <laughs> I don't have a phone with me so so it's, a, it's I'm trying to think of a percent so this oh, this 10 yeah. million is 25 per, almost it's about 25 yeah 20, some between 20 and 25 percent of this and that's not counting the additional 1.6 million so in effect we subtracting that from the original proposal uh, 11 minus 1.6 it's help mm -hmm. me out here uh, <laughs> no 9.9 no sorry it looks like 9.6 <laughs> would be the extra funds that we would that, come out of the room or that I would mm -hmm. ask yeah to come back with a resolution and what it would where this this nine point X dollars would be made up for mm -hmm. uh, I, I just think you know we spent half of the last workshop it's always again about the the present demands on our staff mm -hmm. and it would be a it would be a tremendous goodwill gesture and yet we're still committing to over 75 percent of these funds going into the CIP and mm -hmm. I could I would be very could readily justify that to our city council counterparts to our citizens. So that anybody else? Okay, Mrs. Hughes and then Mrs. Franklin. So <clears throat> I could be mistaken, but weren't some of these CIP projects Weren't we already told a while back that some of them were fully funded? They are. They are. I mean, the two of them are, but that's re it's replacing f future debt with cash is what it's doing so that we don't incur additional debt service. We're trying to reduce the amount of debt service the division would be exposed to. So it's actually just putting PAYGO money in cash in there in, so not to actually issue debt in the future for these projects. And then this, where did this resolution come from? Because didn't didn't all of this go over to city council before it came to the full board? This resolution was presented to city council last week and um, as a preference to the PPA interim agreement discussion. It was mentioned that it was presented to PPMC, that it was for um, had made public by doing that. It was informational only, that PPMC did not have um, any decision-making authority, and that this was an, a recommendation of our intention, but that no, no decisions had been made and that still had needed to go to board for discussion and final action. Okay, well this is obviously not, not your issue, but having a committee do an end run around the mm -hmm. full board is not an acceptable thing to do. This should have been weighed in on by 11 board members, not a committee of what, four or five, however many are on there. Um, Miss, do you want to comment? Yeah, I, I don't quite understand what you just said about the committee doing what? Well, the committee did an end run around the full board. We have 11 elected school board members. No. Excuse me, this is actually my time. Get in the queue and you can say whatever you want. Well, just explain what you said a few minutes ago. You're okay. Right. You're in the queue. So we have, we have a board with 11 members elected by the public, yet we have a committee of, I don't know how many are PPMC, four, three, that created a resolution and sent it to another body before it went to the board. Well, yeah, she just said you did, so. No, no, the PBMC did not create the resolution. The resolution was created by the Department of Budget and Finance, so they did not create the resolution. It was brought to PPMC as we would do any other year 
for them to see it, hear it, make recommendations, talk about it, and then in turn, if they want to reach out and uh, talk with colleagues. So they did not make that resolution. Uh, so if I misspoke earlier, I did not. So they it. approved it going they out. Did not, they just they listened to it and had comment and discussion, but there was no approval because that's not part of what they do. They listened to it and have discussions and comments and can bring that back to colleagues for further discussion, but they don't have any decision-making authority, nor did they write that resolution. All right. Well, resolution that is comes is going to come to a vote to the full board it is. should be seen by the full board before it's sent to another body. So this is just not an acceptable way to do business. But the last thing that I'd like to say is I'm in favor of a tax refund to citizens. We can talk about giving extra money to teachers, and that would be great, but the reality is People want to give them an extra $500, which after taxes might be $250, and, but their taxes are getting raised, so we're giving it to them here. They're going to pay taxes on that money we give them, and then it's going to be taken away by the tax raise that we have to get to give it to them. So, I mean, a tax refund is going to be tax-free money for them. They're getting their own money back. All right, Mrs. Franklin. Well, in my personal opinion, while, and I believe me, I pay plenty in taxes myself, so what I'll tell you is that, in my personal opinion, when we have a, a matter of $1.6 million, over 50,000, uh, you know, family or, or um, folks in the city of Virginia Beach, or 500,000, I'm sorry, um, and it just concerns me that we're, we're talking about, you know, if we're talking about less than $250 just with to uh, over 5,000 teachers getting it back. I mean, I get what you're saying, but I would like to just say that in combination, and I don't know, what what is the number that uh, city council has in, in overage? Um, it was at but 56.2 million, and I can only see right now the certain revenue streams mm -hmm. that are part of the revenue share and formula reconciliation. So they do have other revenues that may be over or underperforming. Okay, so at this point, we, we're not even sure what the city council is going to do. So I'm just yeah. saying, as a body that is here discussing education and you know what we can do for our own um, personnel here. To me personally, what I would like to recommend is that we do focus, and believe me, I have a heart for custodians. I've got a heart uh, for, you know, bus drivers and, um, you know, and, and teacher assistants. I, believe me, I, I understand, but we also accommodated them in different ways because of shortages and because of different things. And right now, a lot of the comments that we are getting are the fact that teachers are overwhelmed with, um, you know, the changes to Canvas, the changes, you know, uh, uh, you know, um, all of the extra work that they've got to do. I think that we do need to address teachers at this moment. Um, it's 1.6 million that we have um, the ability to work with. I, I, you know, I would like to say that Crystal, you are somebody that deals with this and has to approach city council. I mean, certainly I respect your recommendation. Um, you know, if, if you feel like city council will, um, you know, look at it as a goodwill gesture, if we put it back to CIP, um, then, then you know, I, I'd like to know that because, you know, I certainly feel like we need to get that PPA project approved. So, but if my feeling is if we're going to keep the 1.6 million here and we decide to do that, I really propose that we focus on teachers at this time. We have had moments where we focused on other areas. Um, I would like to say right now, I would like to see teachers be the focus if we keep the money here. Thank you. Okay, Ms. Owens. Thank you. Um, I guess to start off, I, I will say I'm open to the idea of understanding what a tax refund would look like. I think when we look at that number broken down, as Ms. Franklin was saying, um, it, it's likely going to be a, a very small number uh, for our, our taxpayers. Uh, obviously, every bit helps. However, it's not all going back to our staff members because they live in this city, because a lot of our staff members can't afford to live in this city anymore. The 
cost of living here is too high and their salaries are too low. Um, and so it is a hard pill for me to swallow and I think for a lot of people in the community to swallow to hear us say we can't replace these older schools in a, a timely manner, we can't give teachers a raise, and at the same time, we're gonna send back money uh, to the taxpayers that is going to be a very small amount. Um, so I, I would like to see us try to utilize that money for our, our staff or put it in the CIP, but I'm open to if that number can be pulled up to give us just a general ballpark idea of what that would look like. I feel like it's always helpful to have informed decisions and to see all of the options. So, because um, I'm gonna be seeking some clarity here, obviously we wanna know what direction we're going in as we you know, prepare uh, a final resolution draft for um, the board to consider at its next meeting. So, yeah, I, I, I do know that, but I, I, I got to get a little clarity. Um, the It's been said a couple times you have $1.6 million to work with. To be clear, the, you have um, $48 million to work with. So, you, you know, 1.6 is, is only the amount that's not currently in this proposed spending plan, that, we, that that's new information that we received from the city in the last day. So the it's really $48 million. So I just want to make sure there's clarity on that as you're having your discussion. Um, and I do at least want to offer this clarity, uh, Mrs. Hughes, in terms of the, the resolution itself. So in a meeting with city staff where we were talking about the PPEA uh, conversation, which was to take place um, last week, it was made very clear to us that city staff believed that um, the degree to which the school board was willing to invest any reversion funds in the CIP would be a helpful part of that conversation. At that point, I said to city staff that we had just presented to the PPMC and there is a public document that is available as a result of that presentation if that would be helpful and they said it would be helpful. So it was not a function of trying to make any end runs. It is why we also sent you the information ahead of the sending it over to the city council to say this is going to go over to city council. But it was it was clear it was certainly made clear to city council uh, both when we sent it over and then and then we went over Crystal and Jack went over and spoke that that was a draft that that was not something the board had taken action on, and that that was simply the recommendation administration was making. Um, about where those funds ought to go based on our understanding from city council and from city staff that um, we need to be focusing reversion funding on our CIP, which is a function of eliminating, as you heard, future debt. Um, and although the, the projects are fully funded in the CIP, the money's not fully appropriated yet. They, it, the idea would be it would be fully appropriated uh, by the end of the six years of that existing CIP. So this would pull down on what needed to be appropriated um, in future years of the CIP, if that makes sense. Okay, now Mrs. Williams. Um, yes, Dr. Spence, I wanted that same clarification. I was going to ask my colleagues. I, I was assuming they were not talking about dividing 1.6 million um, among all of our families because then everybody would get three or four dollars. So, um, so we're talking about 48 million. It, uh, I'm assuming that was your intention, colleagues. Okay. Um, okay. <laughs> and then, um, so I would be, uh, yes, I would be open to, to see what that number is. Um, and it would be nice to be able to kind of figure out or know what city council is thinking. But I guess we don't have that luxury right now because with those two pots of money, we've got, we've got a huge, huge amount there. <clears throat> also, I just want to... Um, just put in there, when, when we get to these CIP projects and buildings, I just hope that when we start um, getting to the to the nuts and bolts of buildings that we're fiscally responsible and, and maybe be very careful in, in what kind of buildings we're building and, um, and, and know that there's a difference between a box with no windows and a building that has every bell and whistle on it that the price tag is unbelievable. So just to get that out there for future conversation. Thank you. 
Uh, Mrs. Manning. Yeah, so when I raised my hand um, regarding the 1.6 million tax, that's not what I was referring to. I was referring to the 48 million, a, a chunk of that going back. So, um, you know, I, in my head, I was thinking more like 10 or 15 million plus whatever city council, if they are considering that as a refund to the taxpayer. So I think that would help. And, you know, Ms. Owens mentioned the cost of living in our city. Well, the cost of living, you know, I saw how much my taxes went up this year. And it wasn't necessarily because there was a rate increase. It was because our assessments went up so drastically. And so um, we have record amount of money in our budget right now, $1.1 billion. And, um, you know, in, in workshop, people were throwing out ideas of how we could spend it. And Dr. Spence, Dr. Spence's response was, well, we've already funded that. We've already funded that. Everything that was thrown out had already been funded. Um, so we have record amounts of spending, and this is an opportunity for us to give the money back into the wallets of the people who have given it to us. So I, I would really like to um, see if we can do that. Mrs. Anderson. I'd like to remind everybody that the revenue sharing formula that this money came from is a written agreement that we have with City Council. The revenue sharing formula, the agreement that we have, is that we get a certain percent of funds that are generated into, into the City Council's budget. And if those funds are shortened, our revenue sharing formula is less for that year. What we found last spring when we were working with trying to come up with uh, funds to possibly give our, well, there was another 22 million last spring that we were, we were asking city council that also was a part of the revenue sharing formula from the previous year. They chose to keep that money. They do this to us frequently. They choose to keep it. However, you know, it's an agreement I just don't understand how, I mean, I get it that they're the ones who have the final say, but when you have an agreement with someone on a, rev, on a formula like this, these are funds and this 48 million that we're talking about are funds that are part of that formula. It's just that they weren't allocated ahead of time, so they're funds that came in after the fact. And so now all we want to do is we want, we want to keep this money. We're entitled to it. It's our money. It is an agreement that we signed with city council on a formula that we agreed to years ago. And I realize that we have to, we have to, by law, we have to, you know, appropriate, give it back, and, we, and then we have to have a resolution asking for them to approve, to give it to us. But it is part of the agreement that they have signed, that their mayor signed with us. So it's not like we're asking for additional money. We're not. We're asking for money that is part of an agreement that we're supposed to get. It is a, an agreement that was signed several years ago. And if, and if you know, if they want to renegotiate the revenue sharing formula, you know, let's sit down at a table and renegotiate it. But right now, this is the formula that we have. And as far as I'm concerned, the school system is entitled to keep this money, you know, and, and they should just say, yes, you may keep it. That's the way I feel about it. So, um, so, with that being said, we're because uh, Dr. Spence, you had mentioned we're talking about forty-eight million. Um, so, with that being said, according to this presentation, twenty-seven two hundred twenty-two four hundred one million um, is part of the revenue sharing formula. Is that truly money that we can count on that we can even be discussing based on? So you, you well, because they did not give us the it's, twenty-two. It's million. there. You can't, you can't count on any of this money being reappropriated to the school division. You can't count on it. It's an annual conversation. That is Correct. the purpose of this reversion conversation. It's an annual conversation where, by law, the school division must re revert its any um, unspent funds at the mm -hmm. end of the true up, at the end of the fiscal sure. year true up. And because we do have a revenue sharing formula, 
we include in that amount in the reversion resolution the part from the city when they've exceeded when they've overperformed in their budget our share of that from the revenue sharing form that we include that amount in the reversion request to say since that would have come to us then we'd like that back for whatever the purposes are. So I just feel like we're kind of putting the cart before before the horse because um, without knowing, based on just last year's experience, without knowing that they're going to get that back to us, it, I just feel mm -hmm. like having a discussion about that. So I, I probably need to clarify that too because yeah. there was a conversation uh, I mentioned about the reversion last year. We received the full amount of the reversion request the that the school board made last year. Mm -hmm. So we received that full okay. amount back. The $22 million that's been uh, tossed around a little bit, I don't want to overcomplicate everything here, but there was a decision made by city council to put a lockbox around the top four cents of, this, of the tax rate. Mm -hmm. That lockbox was put on to fund stormwater mm -hmm. funding in lieu of raising taxes in the sure. city, right? Yeah. So in lieu of raising taxes, they put a lockbox on the, on the top four cents of the, of the current tax rate they said that's going to pay for the stormwater bond referendum, mm -hmm. which the voters approved. Yes. That our percentage, our revenue share from that that top four cents of the tax rate would equate to about twenty two million dollars on an annual basis. Okay. And so we lost when they chose to do that twenty two million dollars from what would have been in this school year's budget and in budgets moving forward. Okay. So I think, not part of the yeah. reversion. I know yeah. it's I know it's a little. Well, I just think that we need to be very clear then, because I think that a lot of numbers get tossed around, mm -hmm. and I I really want to make sure that we are uh, not not just for the board members, but I think for the public, because you know um, we hear conversations later after the meetings, and I I think that it just has to be. We have to provide clarity instead of confusing no, I agree. And people more. And you know, and quite frankly, unless it, unless you tell tell us that you're confident that we are going to get this revenue sharing formula person amount. Right. So, uh, well, what I would say to that is, I'm confident that that money exists. Yeah. Okay. So, in other words, I'm confident that so we know from the true up from the city that that money exists and it's just simply a function of city council ultimately will decide where that money goes whether or not they wish to reappropriate it to the school division for or if they wish to do something else with it now in my nine years in virginia beach they've always reappropriated our, the reversion request from the board to the school division so if i was a gambling person i'd say the odds are pretty good in that what you request is going to come back to you um, but I would also say, you know, they're not going to just do that without knowing what you intend to spend it on, which is sure. the purpose no, no, no. of the okay. resolution. So that's, so I, I just want to make sure that it's clear that that is the purpose of this discussion at this point, is that we are trying to make sure that we are discussing what's going to happen with the 48 million, because we, but we also have an overage of 1.6 million. That was not that's just previously, an additional that, that was not previously in original presentation. Discussed. That's right. I, th I, I just and want that's to make on sure the we're on an even even ground here. So but everybody. it can't be used as it can't be used in, in salaries. So it's important to be clear, right? So when you revert these dollars, they're not part of the next year's budget. So they are not considered ongoing dollars. They're one-time funds. Mm -hmm. Now. It, I mentioned betting a minute ago. You could say, well, we want to put it into salary, and then what you're doing is betting against your next budget that you have that money because if you said, well, we're going to put all $48 million towards teacher salary, and then next year you don't have $48 million in your new revenue in your budget, you're going to be cutting teacher salary. So that's why we never recommend spending one-time dollars on ongoing expenses because that means you've created a hole that you need to fill in your next budget. We don't recommend that as a ge good general budgeting strategy, and and so we wouldn't we wouldn't ever recommend the board um, do that. Mrs. Felton, thank you, Chair Rye. I'd just like to uh, clear up something that the public just heard a few minutes ago concerning the Planning Performance Monitoring Committee, which I am the chair, Miss um, Jennifer Franklin, and Mrs. Anderson sits on the committee as well. That committee job is to listen to plans or anything that's gonna go forward before it goes anywhere. And we deliberate 
minutes and hours sometimes on the language, the logistics, the verbiage that's going to go out and come to you. There has nothing that we have in run to this committee ever, ever. And I will, as long as I'm chair, I plan to keep it that way to be transparent. We've never done that. And I'm glad that Dr. Spence said that they use that as a draft when they talk to city council. We saw all the information, but we did not vote for it to go to um, city council. Never have done that, nor will we ever do that. I will have a conversation and call you three or four times this year before I let it happen because you are part of this board. So I, I want to clear that up, that we didn't do any in runs, that this committee, this committee, the PPMC is committed to this school board to make sure that correct information come out and go into that committee. I just want to clear that up that the public here that we don't do in run um, uh, actions over, over this board. So with no one else in the queue trying to figure the best uh, approach here to give the superintendent some of the guidance he's seeking, because <laughs> this is the last time we meet as a body before, I mean, it's, it's got to come back next time for a vote, so. Uh, I, we could start with just concepts throwing out who, who's in favor of, uh, of using who's in favor of the, the draft as is, who's in favor of using some part of it for, for staff comp uh, bonus. Uh, those are really the two. And, and the third option was presented as well about not spending part of it at all. Uh, Mrs. Anderson. So uh, where, where do we go from here? Should we, should we throw out well, some things and allow us to vote as a unit so we can give mm -hmm. direction to our administration yeah. for developing yeah. this? Well, is there, is there anybody else who hasn't spoken who cares to? Did you have so maybe, w maybe we should start with the present document, the recommendation from staff administration and just an informal who's in favor of it as it is right. presented yes so I, I don't think it's appropriate for us to be taking a vote right now whether you call it informal or formal this is an information agenda um, I personally would like to suggest that we've had ideas thrown out um, perhaps staff could get back to us via email on what those numbers looked like. Like, you know, Miss Anderson put out the idea of giving $1.6 million as a bonus to staff, maybe getting those numbers, maybe more detail of what that looks like. I'll throw out a number of giving $10 million back to the taxpayer, and perhaps staff could give us um, a response of kind of what their suggestions would be to, to how to spend, uh, how to request the additional money that we have in here because you'd have to reallocate it. Um, and so. So is it possible to ask for different versions? Yeah, that's what I, that's kind of what I'm be, suggesting. Yeah, we can work up mm -hmm. a few numbers for you. And um, we certainly can work way. up. I mean, the, the 10 million is just moving it. And then we, what we would do is just tell you where we would move it from. Same thing with, I mean, the 1.6 wouldn't require any movement, but I assume you probably all would want to see something um, akin to, uh, and, and here would, as far as the numbers go, we mentioned the cost of 11.1 million. We mentioned the cost of 5.6 million. If uh, there was going to be a, a doubling of the existing bonus for teachers only and or for st all staff. So we can provide you with a couple of, couple of different scenarios of to say this amount here's where we would move it but i can tell you i mean it's not going to be complicated mm -hmm. so we're not going to recommend you move anything out of that school reserve fund line because that's already in the cip mm -hmm. we're not going to recommend you move anything out of the risk management line because that's a fund balance that's been drawn down because of an electrical uh, problem and if y'all oh, remember right. i want to make sure i say what it was because <laughs> Every time Chris <laughs> says incident, I worry people think, what happened at all? <laughs> we had a lightning strike. <clears throat> Just to be clear, we had a lightning strike at the Holland Road Annex, and that uh, frayed our electrical system. And so that um, that is requiring a total redo of the electrical system. And so um, that, is, uh, that is where that cost is. Anyway, 
Um, so it's not going to come from those bottom two lines. So that's kind of a 13 million that with, with, unless there's some stringent objection, I would say we're going to hold sacrosanct. That's just going to stay in. Um, and so it's just going to come out of the remaining 33 or call it uh, uh, 35 million when you add the 1.6 back in. So it's going to come out of there, which means what we're going to do is we're going to, um, we're, we're not going to probably take the 3.7 million out because uh, we need to replace some authorized but unissued um, debt, you know, bond debt. And we're not uh, likely to take it out of the line there that says 5.5 million because that's money that we're having to kind of fill a hole that was created when the General Assembly lowered the amount of state construction funds available to us. And so what, um, where it's gonna come out of are the three projects. Uh, well, the four, I'll say. so. Um, we could take it out of the payroll system replacement project. You did hear earlier in the workshop that that's likely to be a $14 million cost. And so this is an effort to get ahead of that cost. That's a one-time cost to implement, but it's, we're trying to get ahead of that, but it would come out of either that or one of the three school projects. Um, and so we would, you know, probably, I'm just going to tell you, it just depends on what the amount is. We would just try to take an equal amount from each of those projects. Um, and just if that makes it easier. And so what, what we can do is we'll just tell you what the amounts of each of those three projects would look like with different scenarios in terms of bonus funding and or um, ask to the city to keep some of that money to give it give it back. Does that work for everybody if we just give you those numbers? I'm, I'm just trying to sort of break it down so it's easier. Okay. And since I always... I always have to consider process for the purpose of the next agenda when we do have to post a version that would remain for now the present version with or we'll figure out those details after as to which because you're going to present to us in the meantime three versions but we will have to figure out whether the, the what with the agenda and what ultimately gets posted that's just a chair question in my head Correct. At the end of the day, it, we certainly could pre present you with three, you know, just in that particular piece, that proposed spending plan that is slide uh, six, um, we could just present you three versions of that, and that's relatively easy and postable. So we could do something like that, that then you all could debate and give us some guidance on at your next mm -hmm. meeting when you take action. So if uh, I'll, I'll send you the numbers first. If anybody wants to strenuously discuss that with me in the interim, I'm happy to talk about it, and so is Crystal. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, we'll plan on perhaps giving you a couple different versions to look at when we post for the next meeting. Thank you. Very good. Thank you all. Policy review recommendations. We're up to information item C. Welcome, Mrs. Linetti, our school board attorney. Good evening, Madam Chair, Vice Chair, school board members, and Dr. Spence. I'm Cammie Linetti, school board attorney. On behalf of the Policy Review Committee, I will be presenting the 29 policies and bylaws that the Policy Review Committee worked on. They have been highly efficient the last two months. Now, before we get too panicky, I will tell you that over half of them we're not recommending any changes on, and the others we'll try to go through and explain them to you. But yes, this is a lot of information, and Policy Review Committee is working their way through an awful lot of policies and bylaws right now. Starting with our first one, which would be 351, this is school activity funds. We are Part of the changes in this come in a couple sections. We have changed as of last meeting. You changed your Office of Internal Audit to the Department of Internal Audit, so we needed to correct that language in there. Uh, the one significant change the Policy Review Committee was working on was on Section B, Number 8. Um, we changed the sentence to try to clarify a little bit more, and that sentence will now be, no account is to be overdrawn for any reason unless receipts are forthcoming or there is inventory to support it. We would need an explanation of it, so we're just clarifying that language. Are there any questions about Policy 351? Hearing no questions about policy for 351, I will move on to policy 59. Policy 59 is in our section on students. It is age of entrance for kindergarten. We did look at this last uh, month, and Mrs. Anderson suggests we go back and look at it again. Policy Review Committee had did a lot of work with this one discussing this. What it originally said was that no child, which again is what the state law says, 
No child who has not reached their fifth birthday on or before September 30th of the school year shall be eligible for enrollment in kindergarten. That has consistently been your position in Virginia Beach. That is different. The law in Virginia does allow you to, uh, let, under certain circumstances, you can bring a child in whose birthday is between fifth birthday is between September 30th and December 31 at your choice, but our otherwise is kept at September 30th. You have traditionally kept it at the September 30th date. We did need to amend that because the comp interstate compact and the educational opportunity for military children required that you allow military children who have already enrolled into kindergarten, someone else have transferred in here, have to be allowed in if they don't meet that requirement on there. After some discussion, it was decided by the policy review committee that any st uh, child who would, is entering from out of state, same situation as military child, should also be allowed and should not be forced to be taken out of kindergarten. So what the final decision was to add a sentence that would say, all students transferring into the school division who have already been attending kindergarten in an out of state school division will be allowed to enroll in kindergarten under the standards for, under standards for kindergarten enrollment set forth in interstate compact on educational opportunity for military children. And we pulled out the last sentence. That way that applies to both military children and children from out of state. And that is the recommendation we are going to make. And of course, then we then added the legal reference to the interstate compact on there. Are there any questions? So thank you. That was my, I did have that question to clarify that. And I, when I read it, I didn't take it to mean that it did apply to and all children, not just military children. But if the committee feels otherwise, the way it's worded, because the, you're meant, I thought it applied, when I read it, it's, because it's mentioning the military compact, and it's not. Are you seeking clarification? Oh, did I did I did I miss a um, a version that has out of state mentioned? It does say all students transferring into the school division who have already been attending kindergarten in an out of state school division will be allowed to enroll in kindergarten under the standards for kindergarten enrollment set forth in the interstate compact for educational opportunity for military children. I'm That's why I thought it applied just to military children. I'm wondering whether if if we were to change, add one more to this that might clarify that. If we were to read all students transferring into the school division have already been attending kindergarten in out of state school division will be allowed to enroll in kindergarten under the same standards for kindergarten enrollment as set forth in there. So adding the word same, would that clarify it? Thank you. We'll make that change. Are there any further questions about this policy? Hearing no objections, I will add that word to the next version if it's okay to go on to, to consent for next week, our next meeting. Moving on to policy 514, this is our school attendance zone. There are two changes that we need to make under here. First is under C4A. We, what, well, explain quickly. Policy, the ten, school attendance zone that talks about how we come up with our attendance zones, how we assign students in there. This is under the jurisdiction of the policy. Utiliz building Utilization Committee, and they look at this each year. If you look at C4, it talks about when you're formulating redistricting um, recommendations. We go under Section 4, it talks about reporting. It said that the, under 4A, no redistricting recommendation, the BUC shall prepare a final report no later than March 15th of the year. When talking about this, Ms. Anderson pointed out, well, what happens if the meetings don't match up with Mar March 15th on there? Because you'll see later on it says the report will be presented by the BUC chair or designee to the school board for information at a meeting no later than the second school board meeting in March. And we talked about it. We decided that we, there's no really reason that we need to cite in the first line the no later than March 15th. The BUC will get back the final report when they need to. So our recommendation is to take out the language that refers to no later than March 15th in the first sentence. The next change would happen under F, which talks about attendance zone criteria. As you remember, we've added in the last couple of months um, the ability for children of school-based employees, including CSIP employees working in VBS schools, will be allowed to attend the school to which such parent or child reports or as a primary assignment or is within the feeder zone. So this was a benefit that you put in for our employees. It was pointed out to us that we needed to point out that this does not apply to those individuals only receiving a supplement. So the recommendation is that under F3, the line will now read children of school-based employees, including CSEP employees working in VBCBS schools, comma, but excluding those individuals who only receive a supplement, comma, will be allowed to attend school. So that's just clarifying the supplement now doesn't qualify for you. You have to actually be fully um, enrolled, fully employed in the school division. 
Are there any further comments about this policy 514? Moving on to 613, which is in our instruction section. We did see this last month. We came back. We need to remove a reference. In this case, we were removing the reference to half day kindergartens, which had remained since we no longer have half day kindergartens. And there's a clarification in the last sentence in this policy. It would read the superintendent is authorized to make determinations regarding adjustment of school hours and the opening or closing of schools when inclement weather or conditions exist that would prohibit safely conducting schools. And that was the recommendation. We clarified we had originally put in these specific days. And that was it at the request of the school board members. Is that wording okay with you, or do you need any further changes? I think Mrs. Manning was the one who had suggested that. That's fine. Are there any further questions about 613? If there are no questions on 613, I will move on to 557. 557, which is interesting, and it covers a couple different topics. It's vehicles, motorized devices, and animals on school grounds. We did some significant work in this particular policy, and this may not be an area you've thought a lot about. It does something that comes up more periodically for us. In particular, we were looking at changes having to do with animals on school grounds. Now, clarifying for you, there is a state law that talks about service animals on, on school grounds. That is a different policy than we have here. By law, we have to um, allow animals that qualify as service animals under a procedure that's in a different section, as in Section 7, under the um, our service animals. This one has to do with those animals who are not service animals but otherwise in schools hamsters fish bugs things that come in but also we're starting to see more and more um, dogs coming to school and there have there been ongoing concerns in the school administration about what the rules are going to be for those type of animals on school so this section is going to get reworked quite a bit on there so we're now um, to find the first paragraph will now become numbered as paragraph one some of the changes in this will clarify that classroom animals will be limited to rodents reptiles insects arachnids fish or small amphibious animals that are related to classroom activities we'll pull out the reference to service dog and we'll note that the principal building administrator or school administration may revoke permission for classroom animals at any time and there will be no appeal procedures so if your hamster bites somebody your hamster goes home and there's no appeal for that so two only speaking because that's happened in my family many times. All right, so section two will be employees and students are not authorized to have personal pets or animals that do not qualify as trained service dogs or miniature horses because miniature horses qualify as service animals in Virginia in school buildings, vehicles, school grounds, or at school division sponsored events when the employee is working or the student is attending school or participating in the school division sponsored event. So you, no matter what you call it, your pet's not coming into school under circumstances we left set forth further here. Under limited circumstances, the principal or building administrator may authorize an animal to be present in a school division building on school grounds or school vehicles at school division sponsored if the following criteria are met. There's a lot of criteria down here, but some of them have to do with the animal. It can only be an animal has to have a current certification as a training or therapy dog, so it's not just a family pet that you brought in. This actually has to be a dog that's trained, unlike service animals, which we cannot require verification or training on. It has to be under the control of a handler who's not an employer student of the school division, so you can't bring a dog in and carry, take your dog around school all day long with you because you have a job to do or you're, working, you're a student, and so you can't be just bringing your pet in. It also talks about the need for it to have a specific purpose for the dog's presence that, that addresses educational needs of students or work conditions for employees. Such need or purpose must be more than a mascot, a good, general goodwill, or general morale. Example, examples of acceptable purposes are like reading to animals by struggling readers or reading to dogs, specific activities related to kindness or good manners. The dogs are limited to specific hours and day that is present in the building on grounds. Dogs should not be present every day or for the full work day. The rest of these you'll see here are some of the normal procedures that we have in talking about following the conditions. You have to have your shot to keep the dog clean. The dog has to behave themselves. We have to have an assumption of liability by the owner. We have to have clarifications. There have to be uh, rules as to where the dog goes to the bathroom, how long the dog's going out, and some of those standard rules we would do with the service animal. And again, the school administration was going to reserve the right to revoke approval for the dog to access school buildings, grounds, vehicles, or other events, and there's going to be no appeal from that. And specifically, service dogs and miniature horses are exempted from this particular procedure because they fall under a different procedure. Just the reason for this is because we've needed clarification. We're seeing more and more dogs showing up at school, and sometimes we're not following some of the rules that need to be followed for them. So this is a significant right to rewrite to this policy that we're proposing at this time.
Any questions? All right, we're going to move on to our bylaws now. This is Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry, just um, real quick. So this basically says uh, there won't be any times when a school has a, you know, a event, a assembly, and we brought birds in for the kids to look at, or no other animals except for dogs and only dogs under these circumstances? I think those are going to be specific events, like you're going to have llamas come out for the carnival right. event. That would be a specific event, as opposed to this is addressing those animals. So what we're starting to see is people are bringing their dog to school and the dog to school all day long. This is what it's meant to be dealing with. Okay, and this is only um, during instructional hours, or is this just generally to the public they cannot bring their dog to walk the Technically, track Technically, you're school. not supposed to have your animals on the property because there are health concerns with them. I'm not sure that we enforce okay. them, but what you don't realize with dog waste is you get round worms, you get some of the things that are on there. So typically, our animals, if you see the signs, they're not supposed to be on our properties, but I'm not sure that we actually enforce that after hours. Gotcha. Helpful to know. Thank you. Any more questions? All right, let's move on to bylaw 1 1. This is the very first bylaw. It talks about the authority and title for the school board, and we are recommending no changes, amendments to bylaw 1 1. Does anyone have any questions? Hearing no questions, I will move on to bylaw 1 2. This has to do with your corporate seal. After review, we are recommending no recommendation, we're recommending no amendments to bylaw 1 2. Are there any questions on the corporate seal? Hearing no questions on the corporate seal, I will move on to bylaw 1-3, which is powers and duties, and there are no recommended changes to this bylaw. Any questions on bylaw 1-3? Hearing no questions on bylaw 1-3, I move on to bylaw 1-4. This has to do with responsibilities of the school board. Uh, there are no recommended changes for 1-4. Any questions on 1-4? Hearing no questions on 1-4. I will move on to 1-5. This is legal counsel. I've made some changes here because the current name which you've changed, uh, my title is currently the school board attorney. So I've changed that to record in the school board attorney. All there. Also in the bottom paragraph, I'm recommending a sentence that has to do with the ability to hire outside counsel. As we mentioned before, that is part of the understanding that I will clarify and, and get approval from the school board before that's done. So I've gone ahead and added that as, as a final sentence and to the Department of Legal Services. We'll have the ability to come to the school board about hiring outside counsel to s support those matters which we cannot handle. Other than that, there are no other changes recommended to policy 1-5. Are there any questions? Any no questions on 1-5, I'll we'll move on to 1-6, which is physical agent. There are no recommended changes to bylaw 1-6, so are there any questions about bylaw 1-6? Hearing no questions on 1-6, I will move, move on to bylaw 1-8. 1-8 is composition, election, and term of office. I've mentioned this before because of the current changes to the election system and not knowing what the eventual status of the election system in the city is going to be. I'm recommending that we change the first paragraph to read the school board of the city of virginia Beach shall consist of 11 members elected as set forth in legal reference to this bylaw or as enacted by the virginia assembly or as otherwise ordered by a court of competent jurisdiction i'm going to do the best i can to cover whatever the potentials are in the future and again reflecting down in section c the term of office then would be members of the school board elected as specified below in the legal reference to this bylaw or as enacted by the general assembly or as ordered by a court of competent jurisdiction again to reflect what will be is a potential in the future are there any questions about one eight Okay, no questions about 1.8. I would move on to 1.10. There was a minor scrivener change on 1.10, clarifying the word persons ineligible to serve as school board members. And we took out the sentence. So the sentence will now read, persons ineligible to serve as school board members are enumerated in the Code of Virginia 1950 as amended. That was just a clarification for grammatical purposes. Any questions on 1.10? Hearing no questions on 110, I will move on to bylaw 112, which is oath of office. There are no recommended changes to bylaw 112, oath of office. Are there any questions? Hearing no questions on bylaw 112, I will move on to bylaw 113, which is orientation in service programs. There are no recommended changes other than in A2 under documents. It's listing school board members shall be informed of how to lo locate school board policies, bylaws, regulations, current budget, director, personnel 
school Virginia school laws regulation the Virginia Freedom from Act and comma and I was recommending adding the Virginia Public Records Act comma and then goes on to talk about the conflict of interest act and other documents that is in addition to the law that was added a number of years ago you do all receive that but it's not been reflected in this bylaw so we're just recommending adding that any questions on 113 Hearing no questions on 113, we're going to move on to 114, which is compensation and expenses. Under A, uh, Section A, we're going to recommend you add a Section 2. This question gets asked to me periodically every, uh, every several years as to how is a salary determined for the school board members and how do you change it. We always have to look this up when it comes up. So I went ahead and suggested that we add it into the section. So you would have a new Section A2, which would read, School board members may be awarded a salary increase upon an affirmative vote of the school board. Any such vote for salary increase must take place prior to December 31 in any year preceding a year in which school board members are to be elected or appointed. Such increase shall become effective on January 1 of the following year of the election. And that is just reflected in the law. And then we would add the reference to that under the code section on the second page. Other than that, we have no further recommendations for amendments to bylaw 114. Are there any questions? Any no questions on while 114, I'll move on to 115, which is vacancies. Vacancies, um, we decided to clarify this is a very long um, bylaw, so we put it in sections. So there'll be section A, section B, and section C, dividing up the paragraphs to make it a little bit clearer to read, and just a minor scrivener's change under the second paragraph in paragraph A. Other than that, there are no further recommendations for amendments to bylaw 115. Are there any questions about bylaw 115? Hearing no questions about bylaw 115, move on to bylaw 116. Uh, the only suggestion here, and this is our bylaw 116, is removal from office. We just added the reference code reference to 22.129, which was um, an amended in General Assembly last year. So we're just adding that reference. Other than that, there are no recommended changes to bylaw 116. Are there any questions? Hearing no questions on bylaw 116, we will move on to bylaw 117. And 117 has to do with publications regarding school board. Under Section C, it has to do with individual school board members' publications on social media content. The recommendation is that we add a, a final sentence to the par paragraph C, which would read, School board members will be responsible for compliance with applicable provisions of the Virginia Public Records Act retention requirements for such records and will be responsible for compliance with the Virginia Freedom Information Act request for such records. Just going to indicate that the school board made a decision a number of years ago that the school board would not be responsible for individual school board members, personal media um, publications, and when those requests come in, you will be responsible yourself. If you're maintaining your own um, personal website or social media, you need to be responsible for those maintaining the documents and turning them over. And that's just a clarification in that bylaw. Are there any questions? Hearing no questions on 117, we'll move on to 118. This has to do with offices and elections of ter term of office. Um, this came up last year, and during January, we realized we did not no longer have the um, electronic voting board working, and we might have clarify how we do this until we get the electronic voting board working. So, under A1, procedure for electing chair C, if fewer than four candidates are nominated for the chair, Candidates will be voted for electronically, utilizing the voting colors green, red, and yellow on the electronic voting board, if available, or by manual display in the color of choice. School board members participating remotely may verbally inform the clerk of their choice. And that's just a minor clarification of the um, procedure that we done at Section 2. Other than that, there are no reflected changes. We just want to clarify that until such time as we're able to get the electronic voting board up. So. If there are any questions about that, I can answer them. Otherwise, we will move on to 119. Moving on to 119, duties of chair and vice chair. There are no recommended changes to 119. Are there any questions about one, bylaw 119? Hearing no questions on bylaw 119, move on to bylaw 120, which has to do with duties of the clerk, deputy clerk, and acting clerk, bonds, and oaths. This is frequently an issue that comes up. A lot of people do not understand the changes in law, and quite honestly, the state law is a bit out of date with how things are done. Um, the suggestion we made up to VDOE and other areas that they need to clarify this area of the law. We are suggesting adding to Section A, which is duties of the clerk, a new paragraph 7, which will read, keep in a separate volume the minutes of the meetings of the school board. The clerk or superintendent may designate other employees to keep records of all bids submitted on buildings, materials, supplies, work, or project to be let to contract by the school board, as well as receipts to certain records as provided by the Board of Education on files, 
vouchers, contracts, and other official papers. One of the clarifications are when you're a much school, a smaller school division, sometimes that information is kept by the clerk. In a school division this size, that's often kept in our financial offices. So we're just clarifying that the, that's where those documents will be. If you flip over to the bonds, this is an area that people frequently misunderstand. You have the ability to do bonds for your clerks on there, but most times they're now, and pretty much most school divisions in Virginia have this. They are covered by your insurance programs that you have will cover this. So there's not the necessity to have a bond. So under section C, you would add a final sentence that would see read, the school board authorizes the superintendent to provide adequate insurance for the clerk and the deputy clerk in lieu of posting a bond. Are there any other questions that have to do with policy one, no, sorry, bylaw 119? Yeah, sorry, that's bylaw 120. And no questions on bylaw 120, I'll move on to bylaw 121. This is officer vacancies. There are no recommended changes for this bylaw. Are there any questions? Hearing no questions on bylaw 120, I'll recommend look at bylaw 123, which is authority of members. I, want to say, I don't think there are any changes in this one. Yeah, there are no changes in authority of members under bylaw 123. Are there any questions? Not a question, Kimmy, but just for clarity's sake, for anybody that might be looking at it, bylaw 121 did have some Scribner changes. Did I miss that? Yeah. yeah. yeah you said there were no recommended. It's just. Yeah, uh, you're right. I don't put this out in color. All right. Yes, yeah, so what we're recommending is we're moving it to the words um, chair and taking out his or her. Um, Bylaw 123, I'm trying to look see if I'm going to change this there. I don't believe there are changes there. And bylaw 124, which has to do with the conflict of interest, immunity, disclosure statements, personal interest, economic advisory, several changes were here. Under A, which has to do with conflict of interest, we added some of the language in the statute. You'll see added in there referencing um, prohibited conduct and contracts or closed sessions. Also, we're recommending that you add a final sentence to section A, which would be, School board members are responsible for reviewing agendas and other materials prior to action on or participation in matters that the school board member may have a conflict of interest on. This is just a re reminder, school board members, to please read your agenda and materials for your meetings so in case you have a conflict, you don't disqualify yourself or disqualify the amount of people we need to for the meeting to go forward. That's more of a reminder. Section E read immunity. Didn't seem to be a good reason why the immunity would be under this particular section. So my suggestion was to um, change it to training. And the fact that each school board member has to obtain training on the act as required by law, submit evidence of such training to the school board clerk. School board members will receive a copy of the act within two weeks of their election and their appointment and are responsible for reading the act and complying with the terms of the act. And of course, that you've all received that if, either when you were elected or uh, reelected or appointed to office. Other than that, there are no other recommended changes. Um, other than, sorry, there is a reference to taking out to the city attorney and referring the school board legal counsel is now will be the school board attorney and the reference to the city attorney where you go for your opinions is no longer valid. Are there any questions about bylaw 124? Bylaw 134 it has to do with the annual report. There are no recommended changes to this bylaw. Are there any questions about 134? Hearing no questions on 134, we, bylaw 143 is school board meeting minutes and maintenance of meeting documents posting and meeting minutes. There are no recommended changes under bylaw 143. Any questions? And bylaw 145, there are minor changes to this. The bylaw 145 has the school board meeting minutes retention schedule. The change re recommended is that the clerk will maintain the school board minutes in accordance with applicable law. And with the prior approval of the school board, the clerk may have the school board minutes retained in electronic format, taking out the word microfilmed. And then, of course, that's a 10-year period. These are requirements that the Library of Virginia has that the clerk must follow. And we're just re um, reflecting that's currently electronic materials. Other than that, there are no recommended changes to bylaw 145. Are there any questions on 145? And finally, on bylaw, no, so bylaw appendix C, under section C1 and 2, so, again, we just some clarification. C has to do with the annual chair. One is annual annual electoral committee chair. At the first meeting in the new fiscal year, when the chair is removed from the committee, or comma when the chair is no longer a member of the school board, comma or after new committee is created, a school board chair shall be elected by the voting members. So we're suggesting adding the phrase when the school chair is no longer a member of the school board, because that can happen after election or resignation from office. And C2, 
uh, just recommended. I think this was actually just a um, taking the word um, committee, sorry, committee and making a lowercase c, and it just came out as a whole word got changed on that. So it's a minor scrivener change. Are there any questions about Appendix C? Hearing no questions about Appendix C, congratulations, you just finished 29 policies and bylaws. <laughs> Thank you, Mrs. Linetti, and our policy review committee for your continued attention to these matters. Uh, so that brings us to the consent agenda portion of the meeting, and I'll announce uh, the short agenda. Well, we have three resolutions which we'll read before we entertain motions. We have the National Military Family Appreciation Month, National Native American Heritage Month, and National School Psychology Week. We have B, recommendation of general contractor for Malibu Elementary School, MAUA replacement. And C is our school year 21-22 annual field trip report. So I'll go back to A1 and um, We'll, read, we'll have the resolution read for fam, National Family, Military Family Appreciation Month. Thank you. This resolution is um, dear to my heart. I have both of my sons who are active duty current, currently, so, and my husband is retired, um, retired Navy, so. Whereas, our country owes the daily freedoms to the members of the armed forces, their family members and loved ones who share in their service and sacrifice. And whereas, we celebrate the exceptional service, strength and character of the approximately 13,000 military connected youth and families of Virginia Beach City Public Schools. And whereas, we acknowledge that military families face unique challenges due to deployment, reintegration, service in combat zones, and frequent relocations based on duty assignments. And whereas the school board of the city of Virginia Beach reaffirms their commitment to providing the resources and programs to support military connected youth academically, socially, and emotionally. And whereas the Virginia Beach City Public School Board's Compass to 2025 strategic plan calls for the continued creation of opportunities for military families and community members to purposely partner with schools in supporting student achievement, aspirations, and social emotional development. And whereas November is recognized as Military Family Month, now therefore be it resolved that the School Board of the City of Virginia Beach officially recognizes November as Military Family Month, and be it further resolved that the School Board of the City of Virginia Beach encourages all school staff and community members to initiate, support, and participate in appreciation activities designed to recognize the exceptional role and unique sacrifices our military connected youth make in, in our nation's best interest. And be it further resolved that a copy of this resolution be spread across the official minutes of this board adopted by the School Board of the City of Virginia Beach this 25th day of October, 2022. Thank you, Mrs. Anderson. Second resolution, National Native American Heritage Month. National Native American Heritage Month, November 2022. Whereas, as the first people to inhabit North America, American Indians and Alaskan Natives have profoundly shaped our country's character and cultural heritage. And whereas, Virginia began celebrating American Indian Day in 1987, and whereas, Virginia is home to seven federally recognized tribal nations, including the Chickahominy Indian Tribe, the Chickahominy Indian Tribe Eastern Division, Monacan Indian Nation, Nansman Indian Nation, Pumaki, Pamunkey Indian Tribe, Rappahannock Tribe, and Upper Mattaponi Indian Tribe, as well as four additional state recognized tribes, including the Cherokee Hanka, Nottaway Indian Tribe, Mattaponi Indian Tribe, Nottaway Indian Tribe of Virginia, and Patawomic. Indian tribe of Virginia, and whereas Native American men and women contribute to all areas of life in Virginia and the city of Virginia Beach, including but not limited to government, business, arts and sciences, medicine, education, law enforcement, and the military, and whereas through the study of Native Americans and their traditions and values inspired and continue to inspire the ideals of self-governance and determination that are the framework of our nation. And whereas 
the School Board of the City of Virginia Beach, through its core values and educational equity policy, are committed to the cross-cultural competence within our school division. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the School Board of the City of Virginia Beach officially recognizes the month of November 2022 as National Native American Heritage Month, and be it further resolved that the School Board of the City of Virginia Beach encourages all citizens to support and celebrate American Indians of Virginia, whose abilities and contributions strengthen our city and school's diverse culture. And be it further resolved that a copy of this resolution be spread across the official minutes of this board adopted by the School Board of the City of Virginia Beach this 25th day of October, 2022. Thank you, Mrs. Riggs. And that brings us to number three, National School Psychology Week. All right, thank you. National School Psychology Week, November 7th through 11th, 2022. Whereas Virginia Beach City Public Schools psychologists support the development of academic and social emotional skills for all students, thus allowing each student to reach their full potential and whereas Virginia Beach City Public Schools psychologists are valuable members of the multidisciplinary team serving schools, providing a wide range of services uh, to students, parents, and staff, and whereas Virginia Beach City Public Schools psychologists are actively committed to helping students recognize their abilities, strengths, interests, and talents as these traits relate to their development and mental wellness, and whereas Virginia Beach City Public Schools psychologists help parents focus on ways to further the educational, personal, and social emotional growth of their children, and whereas Virginia Beach City Public Schools psychologists work with teachers and other educators to help in meeting the individual needs of students, and whereas Virginia Beach City Public Schools psychologists use their expertise in child development, mental health, community resources, and crisis intervention to develop and implement interventions to support educational success. Whereas with this shared approach to supporting student learning and social emotional growth, psychologists are considered an integral part of the educational process that enables all students to achieve success and wellness in school and life. Now therefore be it resolved that the school board of the city of Virginia Beach recognized the first full week of November 2022 as National School Psychology Week in Virginia Beach City Public Schools, and be it further resolved that a copy of this resolution be spread across the official minutes of this board, adopted by the school board of the city of Virginia Beach this 25th day of October 2022. Thank you. All right, so the all, all, they've all been presented, so motion to approve. Mrs. Franklin and a second, Mrs. Riggs. All in favor, show a raised hand. Madam Chair, we have a unanimous vote. The motion did pass. Thank you. Okay, action item of the agenda for all who have been patiently waiting. Uh, starting with... Uh, so the personnel, re this is the personnel report, administrative appointments, motion to approve. So Mrs. Melnick and a second, Mrs. Uh, Ms. Owens, um, any discussion? Oops, somebody, I, I think I jinxed with my comment about being so patient. <laughs> I'm sorry, so I got distracted. Do we have a second? We did, okay. All in favor, show, oh, any discussion? That's what I was asking. Okay, then all in favor, show a raised hand, please. Okay. Madam Chair, we have unanimous vote. The motion did pass. Thank you. So now, Dr. Spence, would you please proceed with uh, announcing your administrative appointments? I will. Thank you uh, very much. And so first, I'd like to ask Meredith Hobson to please stand up. So Ms. Hobson has served as a teacher and lead teacher for English as a second language in Title III in Pender County, North Carolina. She's been a teacher in Chesapeake Public Schools, most recently has been serving as senior coordinator of world languages and English as a second language programs for Norfolk Public Schools. We're pleased this evening you've accepted our recommendation for her to serve as the next coordinator for equity and opportunity in the office of the superintendent. Congratulations. Yeah. 
And before you sit down, I think you have some guests with you. Would you like to introduce them? Please, please stand. <laughs> <laughs> and next, if I could ask Carla Smith to please uh, stand up. You all recognize Carla. Carla has served as an insurance specialist and quality assurance coordinator for USAA. And since 2004, has served as a procurement system specialist, a procurement specialist, a contract specialist in the Office of Purchasing Services. Most recently, she's been serving as coordinator of purchasing and the Office of Purchasing Services this evening. We're pleased you've accepted our recommendation for her to serve as the next next Director of Purchasing in the Office of Purchasing Services. Congratulations. <laughs> and I believe you also have a guest with you. Mm -hmm. This is my husband, Leslie Smith, and uh, our children. Yeah. <laughs> 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 from Portland, Oregon, and Hudson, South Carolina. Oh! <laughs> and Madam Chair, that's all. Congratulations to all of you. We appreciate you being here tonight. Is this the next one? This one? I mean, somebody should talk. How are you? So. So action agenda item B is budget transfers, uh, motion to approve. Mrs. Holtz, a second. Mrs. Melnick, uh, Ms. Pate's available with for any questions. Do you, do you want to give a quick recap of? Um, yes, I can. So there's only two budget transfers coming before you this evening. Um, the first one in the amount of $875,000. Um, that is related to uh, offset the cost of the reorganization within the Office of Transportation and Fleet Management Services. Um, if you recall, back in July, beginning of July, there was a memo to the school board members from Dr. Spence that kind of outlined those um, changes in, uh, to the reorganization of that area. And that part of that memo included this 875000 to help offset the cost of that reorganization along with savings that they were also going to see from that reorganization. The second one uh, is for $347,549. Um, that is in the telecommunications cost center. Um, that budget is taking, um, was probably one of the more initial budgets, and so it was getting hit pretty hard um, with the increased costs for equipment and fiber maintenance and also for Ring Central, which is something we implemented during um, the pandemic and has served a great purpose for the division for doing business. And so we were actually increasing that budget to offset the cost in that cost center. Thank you. So with, with that further uh, elaboration, are there any questions? All right, hearing none, all in favor, show a raised hand, please. Madam Chair, we have Madam Chair, we have a unanimous vote. The motion did pass. Thank you, Madam Clerk. All right, action item C, educational equity plan. Uh, motion to approve. Ms. Owens and a second, Mrs. Melnick. Any dis discussion? We had a, a good discussion the last meeting, a good presentation. All right, hearing none. Motion. I mean, all in favor, show a raised hand, please. Madam Chair, we have a unanimous vote. The motion did pass. Thank you all and Madam Clerk. Action item D is calendar adjustment. Uh, so motion to approve, Ms. Riggs, and a second, Mrs. Anderson. And it looks like it's Mr. Delaney who's here to just give a quick recap of what this, again, these proposed changes are. Thank you. Uh, good evening. These proposed changes uh, that we asked for were to create adjusted dismissal days on the 22-23 calendar for our high school students from June 13th to June 16th, which allows for final exams to be created, uh, completed and also allows for graduation start times to, to be adjusted. 
We also requested adjustment to the 23-24 calendar to move the March 4th staff day to Tuesday, March 5th. That's the presidential primary Super Tuesday uh, day. We'd like our schools empty on that day if possible of students. And then we'd also have a June 11th to 14th high school adjusted dismissal uh, in 23-24 for the same reasons for the initial request for this year. So any for any questions for Mr. Delaney? Mrs. Anderson. Uh, during the workshop today, it was suggested, I believe it was the workshop, wasn't it, Mrs. Riggs? It was suggested that we take a look at um, giving the high school teachers second, I think just high school, not, not all secondary, but just high school teachers, um, two work days at the end of the semester instead of one. That's been approved for the 23-24 calendar. If yeah. you recall, we have the 29th, I think it's January 29th, is a staff day. The 30th is a flex day. So that was included in the 23-24 calendar as a result of the conversations we had in the spring of what the pre-Labor Day calendar would provide for us. Starting post Labor Day this year did not make that possible to have the two days okay. in January. If we so we took care of it for day. next year. Correct. Okay. We could um, make, I had a little discussion um, in the break, we could make um, one adjustment, which could be, but you'd, you'd have to do it now and make sure that folks were aware of it. So I'm only throwing it out there for your consideration in this discussion of a half day on the last day of the semester, which would allow some uh, planning time for those teachers who are in the high school so you could do a half day at the end of the semester that would still be an instructional day that would still count towards um, the required days for instruction within this calendar but we give you a little bit of flexibility there doesn't really like do handle everything but i'm just throwing That's that out as one potential rich. solution I, mean, I see <laughs> then i because you've thrown that out there that was one of the suggestions too um i would like for us to make that motion to take that day uh, and make it a half day for the high school teachers um, because they, yes. Sure. Or all, then all teachers, okay, all teachers. Um, and that would be wonderful, at least something to help. And thank you for talking about that during our break, uh, administrators. We appreciate that. Um, so because anything would help. Wait, I'll, I'll be she's not done speaking. Okay. We would be happy. <laughs> you know, we're happy for that. So um, thank you for listening. I want to make that motion to Amen. take that half day on, the, what, the 30th? I'd have, I don't have the date of this year on my, on the 27th. 27th. Um, in addition, for all teachers, for the half day for uh, uh, work day. So I'll ask for a second, then we'll I take more questions and comments. Okay, second, Mrs. Anderson. Mrs. Weems, is your hand up? Uh, yeah, I just want to clarify because I think I heard different things. So this is a half day for all students and a work day for all teachers or just high school? Okay. That's correct. We couldn't make it work without doing it for everybody with okay. the transportation schedule. Okay, so everybody, all students get a half day, Go to only go to school for a half day that day. Okay. And that would be January 27th, is that correct? Correct. Mrs. Manning. So as a mom of a former student in one of our specialty programs, the half-day programs, that's a full day gone for them. And I just, that's a lot. That is a lot for our students at the Career and Technical Education Center, the ATC. Um, it's just a lot for them. And, I, you know, while I want to give our teachers more time I just this our kids need this instruction um, I mean I just please don't take that away from them mrs. Briggs okay I what I want to say I know it's a lot for the you're you're saying it's taking away instruction but it also it's not only giving the teachers that time to plan and whatever but it's also giving them time they've mentioned to us that they're not able to give their students what they need. And that's that time to be able to work with them, write letters for them, for recommendations for college. So it's not just their own planning time, it's to help the students as well. It's not just to help the teachers. So this is this is an addition. This is this in turn will help the students because it is helping the teachers help the students. 
uh, Mrs. Hughes. Yeah, I'm curious why, I see the original proposal here is half days for just high school students, why it's feasible to do that for like three days, but it's not feasible to do it one day in January. Is the transportation different in June or January? That didn't make any sense. I believe you're, you're asking why the elementary can't still go f a full day. Is that your question? Yeah, because we're looking at half days just for high schools for these days that was in, that were in the proposal that he mentioned, but we were told we couldn't do a half day just for high schoolers in January because it wouldn't be feasible for transportation. So either it would be feasible for both or neither, wouldn't it? Yeah, I think the issue for us is just the timing of it, but you know, certainly if the board wants to tell us that they want to do only half days for high school, we can we can look at that as well. Mrs. Riggs. Okay, so Dr. Spence, you, you said that. Is there any other reasons administrators can think of? I know that I just saw uh, Dr. Robertson looking at his computer. Is there any Anything that you can say to that question from um, Mrs. Hughes? Can you repeat your question? Because I was looking at something. No, that's okay. So Mr. Delaney is proposing some half days January for 20th. high schoolers only in, I don't see what all the dates are here. I do see some in June for early dismissal. 13th through the 16th, Tuesday okay. through Friday. Okay. And then and then um, we talked about, Ms. Riggs is talking about a half day. And we were discussing just high schoolers earlier, but Dr. Spence just said we couldn't do just high schoolers in January because of transportation issues, but we seem to be able to do it for four days in June. Don't we have the same transportation issues? So I would have to ask Mr. Freeman that question around the transportation piece. That's it, man. Buck stops with you. Unfortunately, we're not going to be able to give it. I just need a little bit of time to research to see what the what the issues are, and we can get back to you on that. Thank you. So I thought we had to vote for it today, tonight. Well, we could there could be a vote on well we still have this on the table to, to vote for but we can come back on this we can have the calendar on the agenda again although time's a wasting i understand this is january yes um in the exam schedule in june is that a full day exam schedule or those is that a modified day in june it is the typical school day we used to use for exams so they mm -hmm. typically dismiss around 11 right. 30. Mm -hmm. um, on those hat now again when the if you take a look at what miss manning was asking about the tech centers are all shut down by that time mm -hmm. um, on a typical adjusted dismissal day the morning atc tech center environmental study still goes to those campuses and then we just don't have um, afternoon sessions. But you're looking at about an hour and a half exam, two exams a day uh, from Tuesday through Friday. Right. The intent of this, again, was for that purpose and getting feedback from teachers and administration of what it was like on the high school to have a full day with exams, some students taking them, some not, and then preparing for graduation. That was the feedback we received from that group and the purpose for moving that recommendation forward. So it's slightly mod it's so modified. So to Ms. Okay. Hughes's question about transportation, mm -hmm. we did discuss with transportation this calendar adjustment, and they said they could make it happen. I think as I heard Dr. Spence say, on short notice, it's not as easy to say, yes, we can just do that without having that conversation back with transportation. Well, my only input is that this is our first year with the four by four and um, full and the full um, AB schedule um, that this is a nice time for teachers to end the semester and have a little bit of extra planning time. It, you know, this was this this is a big this was a big year for them, and I think they it you know would appreciate this half day. Yeah, if you recall when we had the calendar conversation on multiple occasions last year, we talked about that pre Labor Day allows for that additional staff day for high school, and we we decided Sorry. to hold a year on that, which then limited us there, which would 
lend itself to why that would have to be a recommendation for kids to be in school on that day. Mrs. Manning. So I support all the changes that administration brought forward. Could I suggest to you, Ms. Riggs, since this is your motion, that we vote on, that, that we hold off on your suggested changes until the next meeting for them to research it? Let's just vote on the changes that we need to get in place now, have them research it, and maybe add this to the agenda for the next meeting. Would you be okay with that? I would be okay with that if administration feels like that's not too as, timely as and an it's action, going to as an action item so there would definitely be a vote yeah we wouldn't we wouldn't prolong it with information right We're, we agree yeah as an action item action. yeah if i can add one thing there the importance of the recommendation we made prior to the amendment was we are really looking to lock in those graduation dates as well yeah. uh, we're holding off the convention center a little bit on that I know uh, David Rhodes and Marianne Laffler are chomping at the bit to say, can we solidify those graduation times that will be adjusted as a result of the change to the calendar? Then I agree to that. So you'll withdraw your mm -hmm. motion? I withdraw that motion and bring it to our next meeting. Thank so you Pastor guys can have time to, to look at the transportation. And just to reiterate for the benefit of the public, and this is why I reached out to Dr. Robertson a few days ago, again, just to really scrutinize that calendar and to see how we could make this work, is uh, that the the four by four, it, it's a twofold uh, responsibility of closing the semester for your semester one students and the typical time that goes into that, but then also you're getting a new crop of students the next semester and while some are teaching the same subjects some are not so then it and and obviously they don't wait till that last day for all the planning but they you know just again it comes down to if the kids are going to get a solid start with their with their second four by four semester we need a teacher who can be as, as feel as be and feel as prepared as possible so i feel that's why it can be win-win for both i would also add school counselors and administrators will appreciate that time as well mm -hmm. um, as they adjust student schedules so th they will certainly appreciate the consideration so then if i could go back yes i'm um, sorry madam chair i know that miss riggs withdrew but does Ms. Anderson also withdraw? I was going to try to say that, but yes, I do. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so the original motion on the floor, which has been seconded, is up for a vote, and that's the administrative changes that were proposed coming into the meeting tonight. So all in favor, show a raised hand, please. Madam Chair, we have a unanimous vote. The motion did pass. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. So we just end now with our committee organization or board reports uh, before we do go into closed session. So who would who would like to begin? Yes. Yes. How did that go right over my head? Okay. I'm sorry. Wow. I apologize. Wow. All right. Okay. Back to. Back to committee reports. And who had a hand over here for committee reports? Okay. Mrs. Holtz. The uh, Consortium for Learning that meets at WHRO met last week. And there was a spotlight presentation by the National History Day, Sam Flora. He manages the public programs. And he briefed the group on the local and national history day project. Uh, it is a project-based learning program, and the program is open to all Virginia students in grades 4 through 12. And, of course, it's aligned with the standards of learning. Now, this committee only meets like four times a year, so it might seem a little premature to mention it because the contest is a contest with cash prizes and also special awards. It meets in uh, March, but there's a whole lot of preparation that comes into it. So uh, the contest for this district will be held March 18th at the Military Aviation Museum in Virginia Beach and in the Virginia Museum of History of Culture in Richmond as a, as a follow-up. So uh, this information will be disseminated in the near future to all of our schools and to teachers that have students 
from grades four through 12 who would be interested in it. So I'm sure you'll be hearing more about it. Thank you. Anybody else? Mrs. Riggs. Can I just say something? Not, it wasn't about a committee, but it was something else, but it was a visit. It's kind of, it's like our partnerships. Go ahead. Okay. I, I just had to say this. Um, I visited a lot of my schools last week um, for my partnerships. And um, one of the schools, all of them actually, but North Landing was really, I just have to say, guys walk around that school or any of our schools, but especially that particular day, there was not one Chromebook open. Those kids were all over their classrooms doing activities and working and learning. And there was one mapping. There was one uh, group of kids out in the hall rolling a tangerine with their nose. And then they were going to um, put it on a chart and, and, and measure it. It was just amazing all the things that they were doing. First graders uh, watching a story being told. And then they got they were in collaboration groups and discussing the uh, characters. And then the next thing they discussed it, discussed in their group were the settings and it was just amazing all of the many things they were doing and that's that was all the schools and I also have to say a shout out to uh, Kellum High School because uh, the art teacher got teacher of the year this year and she is uh, um, special to my heart because I taught her in kindergarten in creeds so um, just a shout out to, to Laura Peters and Mrs. Manning. Yes, yeah, so um, Mayor's Committee for Persons with Disabilities is accepting their annual nominations for community members or businesses that go above and beyond um, for people with special needs in our community. Um, the information is on the city website, but if anyone has a nomination, they can um, fill out that form, send it in. If anyone has any questions, uh, please let me know. Thank you. And Governance Committee meets November 2nd. And again, just wrapping up some uh, last piece of, of personnel matter that will come before the, the board and any other updates at that point, too, with the new legal services department. So with that, Mrs. Melnick, would you kindly read us into closed session? I move that the school board recess into closed session in accordance with the exceptions to open meeting laws set forth in the Code of Virginia, Section 2.2-3711, to deliberate on the following matters. Discussion, consideration, or interviews of prospective candidates for employment, assignment, appointment, promotion, performance, demotion, salaries, disciplining, or resignation of specific public officers, appointees, or employees of any public body, and evaluation of performance of departments or schools of public institutions of higher education where such evaluation will necessarily involve discussion of the performance of specific individuals. Two, discussion or consideration of admission or disciplinary matters, matters or any other matters that would involve the disclosure of information contained in a scholastic record concerning any student of any public institution of higher education in the Commonwealth or in any state school system. Seven, consultation with legal counsel and briefings by staff members or consultants pertaining to actual or probable, probable, probable litigation where such consultation or briefing in open meeting would adversely affect the negotiating or litigating posture of the public body. For the purposes of this subdivision, probable litigation means litigation that has been specifically threatened or on which the public body or its legal counsel has a reasonable basis to believe will be comm commenced by or against a known party. Nothing in this subdivision shall be construed to permit the closure of a meeting merely because an attorney representing the public body is in attendance or is consulted on a matter. Eight, consultation with legal counsel employed or retained by a public body regarding specific legal matters requiring the provision of legal advice by such counsel. Nothing in this subdivision shall be construed to permit the closure of a meeting merely because an attorney representing the public body is in attendance or is consultant on a matter, namely to discuss one pending student complaint process and related matters, two requests for payment of alleged damages before a lawsuit is filed. I made the motion. And a second, Mrs. Uh, Manning. Okay, all in favor, show a raised hand. Madam Chair, we have, 11, we have an unanimous vote to go into closed session.
of recorded vote and in accordance with the provisions of the Virginia Freedom of Information Act. And whereas section 2.2-3712D of the Code of Virginia requires a certification by this school board that such closed meeting was conducted in conformity with Virginia law. Now therefore be it resolved that the school board of the city of Virginia Beach hereby certifies that to the best of each member's knowledge, only public business matters lawfully exempted from open meeting requirements by Virginia law were discussed in the closed meeting to which this certification applies, and only such public business matters as were identified in the motion by which the closed meeting was convened were heard, discussed, or considered. Motion to approve. Mrs. Franklin and a second. Mrs. Riggs, all in favor, show a raised hand, please. We have a unanimous vote. The motion did pass. Okay. We are adjourned. Safe travels home.